welcome to all participants to this workshop on alternative fuels and power solutions for shipping and ports. We are very happy to welcome uh, people in person today here at Thames and Lisbon and people that are connected online from all over the world. The number of registrations that we have clearly indicate that there is a very, very strong interest to discuss a technical level the topics that are going to be the focus of this three-day workshop. We have followed a modular approach and uh, the three modules will, of course, uh, put in the spotlight first alternative fuels and the two new studies that we have developed as EMSA with the help of a contractor. And then we will have a module on energy storage systems on board of ships and the module on shoreside electricity. Throughout these days, we count on uh, interaction. That's the secret of a successful workshop. Without further ado, I give the floor to our executive director, Maya Markovcic Kostelas, for some words of welcome and introduction. Maya, the floor is yours. Thank you, Manuela. I've heard that for Zoom purposes, it's better that I stand uh, here. Uh, welcome once again uh, to all of you sitting in our conference hall here and to all of you connected. Obviously, the number of participants uh, demonstrate that the topic we have chosen to discuss these three days is um, a very prominent one. And indeed, the purpose of this workshop is to discuss from the technical perspective some of the aspects and potential of the uh, two uh, possible alternative fuels, as well as to discuss the uh, electricity and electrical uh, power supply in ports and for ships, um, together with its important safety aspects. So uh, let me first start by thanking uh, those who enabled this uh, workshop. I will start uh, by our colleagues and experts from ABS, Arcilea, Arcilea and C. Delft, uh, our contractor who developed the studies which are going to be presented and discussed today. Um, and I'm very grateful for their dedicated and professional work um, leading to the important um, new new knowledge that has been gained uh, through this process. I would also like to thank our colleagues from the European Commission, today represented by our ex-colleague Ricardo Battista, uh, but also our colleagues uh, from the IMO, uh, represented here by Mr. Roen Hoendres, who um, have contributed uh, with the exchange of views and the organization capacities in the preparation of this workshop. Um, last but not the least, I would like to heartedly thank all my colleagues uh, from the unit and departments uh, responsible both for sustainability and safety, had by Manuela and Landert, but as you can see, it's the whole team behind. Without their uh, efforts, uh, this workshop will not be able to be taking place today. So indeed, the topics that uh, you are going to discuss in this uh, three days, almost two and a half days, are uh, very pertinent to the maritime, uh, to the greening transformation of maritime transport, which is uh, in the heart of uh, basically all mainstream discussions going on around the globe when it comes to maritime transport. And indeed, um, driven by the 
high level of the climate and environmental uh, ambitions, both in Europe, but more and more, I would say, globally. Uh, shipping is going to phase and has already started uh, into the process of the thorough transformation. And for all thorough transformations of each and every sector, you indeed need to have everybody on board. That is uh, permanent uh, or I would say the most important um, conditions for any um, revolutionary transformation as we like to call this transformation that uh, maritime transport is going to face. On one hand side, you need to have the regulators who needs to build and develop um, solid, understandable and implementable legal framework which at the same time consists uh, or presents a level playing field for the industry. On the other hand side, you also need to have science, developers, innovation, technology. You need to have those who need to implement these innovative solutions. So in our case, shipping and port sector hand in hand to ensure the transformation. But we are, as well know that we are talking about huge investments. So it is equally important that you have the financial sector on board, of course, the proper public um, public financial um, uh, tools, but as well the private financial institutions who needs to support the shipping in this transformational phase, shipping and port sector. Um, we need to talk with the suppliers and suppliers needs to be uh, on board as well, but also the consumers. So somehow we all need to be here and on board. But in these three days, we are going to focus on some technical aspects of two alternative fuels. Plus, as Manuela said, we are also going to discuss safety, safety in the context particularly of the electrical solutions and the use of batteries in maritime transport. Why did we choose these two potential alternative fuels? Well, uh, first of all, because uh, biofuels uh, has been, let's say, discussed in the context of, uh, of EMSA in 2016, when we have developed, um, deployed our first study on biofuels. And second, because the biofuels enable relatively easy uptake. And that is uh, what makes it potentially uh, used in particular in the first phase of the transformation um, because it could be used also with a relatively modest uh, modification on existing fleet. Uh, the second uh, alternative fuel which we are going to discuss uh, today and tomorrow is ammonia, uh, which has the which has signaled to be the potential for the long term uh, transformation or the use as the alternative fuel, um, because it could offer zero or near zero solutions for the maritime transport. Nevertheless. There are still a number of uh, barriers that has been identified uh, for its deployment, so it is very important also to highlight uh, these barriers and identify the gaps that needs to be addressed. Uh, if we are talking about um, altern alternative fuels and the transformation of shipping, and we have to be, uh, let's say, reminded that it, that. Um, a time framework and the deadlines are pretty short with the carbon neutrality targets for 2050 and 55 uh, decrease in CO2 emissions by 2030. We don't have much time to, uh, to lose. So this short-term uh, transition, particularly the, the fuels that has the potential uh, to be used on uh, existing fleet is uh, very important to be taken into the consideration. For us in EMSA, whenever we talk on any topic being in safety, security or sustainability, for us safety is paramount uh, interest. And in that context, um, each study that uh, discuss or each discussion that takes into the consideration alternative fuels needs to have this safety aspect in its focus. We are planning uh, on the basis of the outcomes and the identified challenges 
strategies relating to safety in alter alternative fuel context develop a next, uh, let's say, stage of the studies, which were derived in certain guidances and recommendations uh, relating to the safety. Uh, in that context, we have started uh, with the carriage of um, of the alternative fuel vehicles uh, on board the ships, uh, where in cooperation with the industry, we have developed a guidance, which is going to be presented uh, to you and discussed in next days. The same goes with the guidance of safety of battery energy storage systems on board the ship, which is now in the pipeline and which my colleagues also are eager to discuss with you. When it comes to the um, energy uh, saving and the alternative uh, mode of powering the ship, OPS are certainly one topic that needs to be discussed. Um, as you know, recently there is also a guidance that has been developed um, on the OPS uh, projects on, in ports. Um, unfortunately, the dynamic of the uh, development of these projects are not yet um, in the rhythm as we would like to. We know that at the moment there are around 225 vessels uh, which are OPS ready and only 31 ports in EU which could enable high voltage OPS uh, in the ports. That's not enough and I believe that this chicken and egg question should be replaced by on uh, all on board uh, attitude and we have to understand that we need to work together not wait for one or the other side but rather ensure that two hands go uh, one by um, by another on the side of using and propulsing the ship in the ports in Europe but also globally so, all in all, without an undue uh, delay, I know that my colleagues are eager, both from the uh, Commission and from the IMO, to give us the insights on how are the processes that are very intensive and um, very active in the IMO and in the EU with the um, Fuel EU Maritime Initiative and the extension of ETS on one hand side with the new uh, GAG strategy and so-called uh, life cycle um, exercise in the IMO going on and they will give us the more inside uh, thoughts about these processes and how um, they could influence or facilitate a further dynamic. I can just say at the end that from our side, from EMSA's side, we have also always stayed uh, side by side by the Commission providing them a technical knowledge on one hand side in the development of the new solutions, but also by developing different um, tools and services to enable the implementation of the developed solutions. We had that uh, with, uh, for example, um, TETICU, so-called TETICU, so the tool that has enabled the implementation of Sulfur Directive uh, for the European member states, but also TETIS MRV, uh, which enables the implementation of the reporting formalities derived from, uh, from MRV regulation. Now we are prepared to assist in the similar way the extension of ETS when it is going to be in place, as well uh, to the maritime transport, as well as to enable the, the, the implementation of fuel EU maritime uh, in the sector both uh, on the side let's say of the member states and uh, to assist them uh, the easier transformation for the industry um, so without any undue uh, delay i would like to encourage you to use the opportunity um, to be as active as possible in the format of this workshop. Um, this is not just uh, listen, uh, listen mode, listen and learn mode. It is very important also to hear from those who already implemented the solutions in the practice, but also exchange on the, um, let's say, forthcoming challenges on all of your levels. Uh, with that in mind, I wish you a pleasant stay here in Lisbon and a fruitful discussion in the next two days. Thank you. Thank you, Maya.
for setting the scene from the EMSA perspective. And uh, we continue now with this uh, setting the scene moment, uh, because there is a reason why all of us are today around this table. And we will have uh, uh, the European Commission, represented here by Riccardo Battista from DigiMove, who will provide an overview of the policy initiatives that are currently ongoing at EU level, and they are, of course, pushing for the uptake of alternative sources of power for shipping in the EU. Riccardo, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Good morning to everyone. I uh, would like to uh, first congratulate the agency for the initiative of this uh, uh, three-day uh, series of workshops. Uh, it takes uh, courage to do it at this moment in time. It takes good initiative because it's a particular heated time for discussing on uh, alternative fuels and electrification and all facilitating technological elements for uh, decarbonization and energy transition in shipping. So congratulations to, to EMSA. And on a personal note, it is a pleasure to be back home, as I always feel home uh, in EMSA. Um, at this moment in time, the regulatory framework develops on a particularly heated moment. There is currently negotiations with the co-legislators on a variety of different legislative uh, initiatives under the Fit for 55 package, uh, remarkably all contributing to the economy-wide uh, decarbonization targets of 55% by 2030 and economy-wide decarbonization in the EU by 2050. Um, the context is indeed uh, in, um, enshrined in uh, EU law uh, and all the roadmap that is currently taken for decarbonization refers to the EU climate law where the mandate is inscribed. Um, the 2030 climate target plan defines the 55% reduction of greenhouse gas emissions in 2030 and climate neutrality in 2050. Um, and we had this law entering into force in 2021 and the Fit for 55 package published in July 2021. To give a graphical perspective of the challenge, we're talking about an economy-wide objective. So maritime transport contributes in its own scale. Um, and the fact that we have climate neutrality objective for 2050 doesn't necessarily mean that at sector-wide uh, or at sector-scale uh, performance that we're talking about climate neutrality of each sector. There is uh, offsetting uh, elements which contribute to a net zero economy-wide objective for 2050, with maritime transport being the focus, of course, for this presentation, uh, with a view in particular of the instruments that are relevant for maritime. The Fit for 55 package is a composition uh, of different elements which are um, complementary, continuous um, amongst themselves, some of them re referring to uh, climate, energy, some of them to the more economic aspects of transition, and a good number of them focused on transport. Being maritime and aviation in particular, allow me the comment, in particular those sectors which are more hard to decarbonize, which are more hard to implement in terms of uh, the roadmap to decarbonization. And I select here in particular those that are contributing to the maritime ecosystem, uh, in particular the extension of the ETS to maritime uh, transport, the fuel EU maritime, uh, which are in particular working together uh, as complementary uh, instruments, but also the Renewable Energy Directive, uh, which uh, includes important targets for renewable energy to uh, transport, um, the Alternative Fuel Infrastructure Regulation as a promotion of an existing instrument, the AFID, um, the Energy Taxation Directive, uh, and I include two pieces of the puzzle that you may see here a bit detached because they cannot be taken outside the map, which is the uh, alignment with the IMO and the international framework. And uh, uh, in particular, we need to take into account that both ETS, FuelEU, as regional measures, they are limited 
and they will only be uh, uh, the objectives only be fully successful when we have a wider international global established uh, framework. And the research and innovation, which is an essential pillar for uh, uh, all the technology elements and all the, uh, the aspects that we talk about on alternative fuels, energy conversion systems, uh, and electrification in, in shipping. The objective is clear to decarbonize shipping. We need to uh, inflect the curve of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And for this, we count with energy efficiency, use of clean fuels, operational efficiency, and a number of other elements. Um, and this is a key element that is uh, underlined here is using less fuel or being more energy efficient will not fully do the job. Uh, in fact, the best ton of fuel is the fuel that is not used. And, and for this, in fact, energy efficiency is essential. Um, but using cleaner fuels is fundamental uh, to, to promote. And uh, when we look at the current uh, state of things, the challenges that are presented to shipping is, are characterized by 99% broadly of a fuel mix, which is essentially fossil fuel based a wait-and-see attitude from operators, which technology is going to go first, uh, where should I invest, where should I focus uh, the attention for the renewal of my fleet, and then uh, all the coordination between uh, offer and demand on alternative fuels is, uh, is key to address. The expression chicken and egg is for sure uh, something that is common in, uh, in our reflections, but the regulatory framework uh, is developing with a view to address all the angles, uh, both the demand, the distribution, the supply, so that there is no weaker uh, element in the chain, so that the ecosystem is able to develop in a consistent and coherent manner to support the promotion of alternative fuels. The obligations must be imposed on the demand also because uh, in order to promote investment and to ensure the, that financial decisions are taken uh, in a regulatory uh, certain uh, context. And uh, we also need to understand the challenge of uh, the long lead times that take for fleet renewal and for the development of availability of alternative fuel solutions. The fuel maritime regulation uh, comes then into place to address these challenges, to complement ETS, which on its own would be insufficient to promote the adoption of uh, alternative fuels, renewable and low carbon fuels. Why? Because the carbon price is not sufficient to cover the premium of alternative fuels. And therefore, it is necessary to introduce in the regulatory framework uh, uh, an additional element to promote the use of these technology options. To provide regulatory predictability for this sense and uh, to support uh, global measures at IMO with the greenhouse gas fuel standard and with the well-to-wake life cycle uh, uh, approach to the assessment of greenhouse gas uh, merits of alternative fuels. The fuel you maritime comes here in the central box that you see there in blue, um, but coherent and complementary with other instruments also in the EU context currently under negotiation. So we have the Renewable Energy Directive being updated to include renewable synthetic fuels and sustainability criteria for renewable synthetic fuels, and also uh, uh, to include sustainability uh, elements related to the introduction of renewable energy in transport with specific targets uh, for transport for RFNBOs and, uh, and for advanced biofuels. The fuel distribution with the AFIR being, uh, being uh, uh, incorporated with specific targets for development of uh, shore power, not on a best effort basis, as it was the case of the directive. Now it's as a mandatory requirement, um, where 10 T ports meeting certain thresholds of uh, port visits of different chip types will have to develop onshore power supply solutions, um, and and we'll need to make these available for ships to connect to onshore power. Um, we have also uh, the economic dimension of the fuel uh, ecosystem, which will be brought by the carbon pricing inscribed in ETS and by um, favorable conditions uh, included in the Energy Taxation Directive. Try to include the fuel EU in a nutshell, 
in order not to give you 20 slides of fuel EU. So uh, the fuel EU, in fact, is designed to promote the uptake of renewable and low carbon fuels uh, and works in a conceptual way to complement the energy efficiency uh, push that the ETS will, will bring. So here the focus is use uh, cleaner fuels. The technology neutral approach is a core central element of the fuel EU maritime. So there, are, there is no prescriptive approach of fuel A, B, C or D. So fuels are presented in a way that independently of which operator uses which technology option, you will have a merit in terms of greenhouse gas intensity reduction, which will in the end contribute to uh, demonstrate compliance with the regulation. The regulation establishes limits for greenhouse gas intensity reduction in five year steps until 2050, where you can see a 75% reduction. Bear in mind, some of you may ask, why not 100%? It is 100% in the EU is an economy wide statement, and Maritime contributes in 2050 with 75% reduction of greenhouse gas intensity. You will see also 2 and 6%. You may wonder, Aren't these uh, not so ambitious? So it is, in fact, the concept of uh, a, a gradual approach in order to allow the fuel EU concept to be put in practice, to be implemented, tested, with relatively mild uh, targets in order to allow the industry to um, adapt, fuel availability to develop, and the fleet renewal also to take place. The scope for ships above 5,000 gross tons, the similar scope to the MRV and ETS, covering 50% of international voyages and the whole uh, voyages that take place in intra-EU uh, traffic. Additional requirements for onshore power supply connection, but in fact, broadly for zero emissions at birth, meaning that it is possible to include zero emission technologies such as hydrogen fuel cells or um, uh, electrical energy storage in the ports as possible alternatives to onshore power supply. Um, and this is uh, compulsory as of 2030 for container ships and passenger ships, including cruise ships and uh, row packs. The scope of emissions covered uh, the whole greenhouse gas uh, scope from CO2, methane and nitrous oxides assessed on a well-to-wake uh, framework. So here, the scope encompasses both upstream and uh, downstream contributions. Flexibility mechanism included uh, with banking, borrowing, but also pooling. So it's possible to uh, have different strategies to comply, even when it's difficult to, uh, to have uh, the availability of uh, uh, renewable fuels to, to reduce the greenhouse gas intensity of the energy used. Non-compliance deserving deterrent financial penalty and monitoring reporting based on the MRV approach with the key concept of the reporting only once principle uh, in order to facilitate operators uh, from an administrative perspective. Why the technology neutral approach? Because of the different variety of pathways that we can have for fuel production, but also given the different types of fuel products that we will have competing in the future. Uh, not competing directly because, in fact, different ship, pro different ship operating profiles will, uh, will have different appetites for different fuel products based on energy density, based on safety aspects and other considerations. Fuel certification is an essential pillar of the fuel EU implementation and of level playing field. Only by having a safe, sound, clear, transparent fuel certification uh, framework, it will be possible to ensure that the operators will, will engage on a level playing field using uh, these new, uh, much more expensive fuels. And therefore, the, the framework is essentially based on the red sustainability certification, but with the need to include also distribution, blending and bunkering in the context of an extension of the certification framework to include the broadest possible range of economic operators. How will the fuel EU work? The obligations, as I've mentioned, are both on greenhouse gas intensity reduction, but also on the need to go zero emissions at birth. There will be a, a verification by a third party uh, based on reporting uh, of all the elements related to compliance. 
and in case compliance is verified, a certificate of compliance is issued with flexibility measures that can be used uh, in order to comply and avoid the payment of remedial penalty. Enforcement uh, provisions also include in the fuel EU and in case of disagreement also to complete the cycle, the possibility to request for a review. The state of play, we currently have the Council General approach uh, agreed in, in June. We are currently in the week of plenary vote in the Parliament. So the TRAN committee already adopted a compromise on the 3rd of October and uh, uh, tomorrow the vote in plenary will take place uh, on the fuel EU. Yesterday the discussion was very positive and we expect uh, no major surprises with respect to the vote in plenary. Trilogues will follow and next year will be dedicated to work on the implementation elements, secondary legislation will become fully applicable as of 2025, January. Finally, in reaching the, the end of the presentation, also a, a, a context on the AFIR related to infrastructure and on the red for fuel supply. The AFIR uh, indeed is a significant development when, con when compared with the Alternative Fuel Infrastructure Directive. Um, includes significant obligations for uh, shore power development. Um, and in all 10 t ports to provide LNG bunkering infrastructure. The Renewable Energy Directive uh, uh, EU, at EU level for renewable energy 40% by 2030 and the reduction uh, of greenhouse gas intensity in transport of 30%, 13%, with sub-target of RFNBOs of 2.6%, with a sub-target for maritime of one2 Facilitating elements on research and development, uh, it would be incomplete to be here without mentioning the zero emission waterborne transport as a key initiative and partnership to uh, identify and to uh, promote the demonstration of zero emission uh, technology solutions uh, in the framework of Horizon Europe. And also the Renewable and Low Carbon Fuels uh, Value Chain Alliance, where the industry is already grouped. Uh, more than 200 uh, industry players are already remarkably fuel suppliers uh, and all, all a broad range of uh, operators also involved in the, in the life cycle and in the value chain of renewable and low carbon fuels. Uh, we are just now operating to uh, uh, establish the, the different roundtables to work on aviation, maritime and uh, feedstock. And basically the objective is to increase the availability of uh, low carbon fuels, focusing on drop-in solutions, on blendable solutions, synthetic fuels and biofuels. Thank you very much. And again, thank you to the agency for the initiative with this workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ricardo, for uh, starting putting a, a very important building block in this uh, puzzle that uh, we have, all of us, uh, to put together, as Maya stressed. And, uh, of course, uh, the role of the regulators is uh, to give uh, certainty and predictability. And uh, there is a lot ongoing in this moment at EU level. But not only at EU level, of course, uh, at IMO level, uh, we know very much how important it is to look at uh, global uh, solutions. Uh, and uh, this is for sure a global challenge that needs to be addressed uh, in the IMO forum as well. We are very pleased to have here uh, Rul Henders, the head of air pollution and energy efficiency in the IMO Secretariat. And he will give us the overview of the IMO policies that now are driving to the global uptake of alternative power solutions for shipping. Rule, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Manuela, for that uh, introduction and uh, a very good morning to everybody here in the room and as well, of course, to all the participants joining this event remotely. 
Let me also start by thanking EMSA for taking this initiative, um, for the very good initiative to getting everybody here in the room, but also allowing the remote participation. We're very much looking forward from the IMO perspective to, of course, see all of the discussions and the outputs, the study that has, EMSA has been procuring to find their way to the IMO in order to uh, support all the negotiations and the discussions that are ongoing within the IMO. And uh, on a personal note, like the previous speaker, it's also a, a big pleasure to be here in Portugal, in EMSA. Um, as a former EMSA staff, I wouldn't call it home, but it's definitely, um, like you said, Ricardo, but it's definitely good to be back here. So um, let me browse through the presentation and give you uh, an overview, as Manuela was saying, of everything that's happening within the IMO in terms of putting in place a global regulatory framework that really allows and enables the global industry to move forward to a decarbonization agenda. I think most of you or everyone over here in this room is pretty much familiar with the IMO, but just one point to pick out from this slide and which is pretty important for the rest of my uh, presentation and is quite different, of course, than compared to where we are here in EMSA in the European House is the fact that IMO has 175 member states representing developed and developing country countries, representing small island developing states, very remote from their markets, representing other countries with uh, developing economies. And this is a key factor in the discussions and the negotiations that we're having today in IMO on all the various work streams relating to GHG. So to start off this presentation and to actually uh, go back to what the IMO has been doing uh, on GHG reduction, greenhouse gas reduction and improving the energy efficiency of the global fleet, we actually have been um, working on a very comprehensive regulatory framework of binding requirements that apply worldwide, that are being enforced worldwide, both through the flag and through the port states, in terms of uh, energy efficiency requirements. And I won't dwell on these, but actually I just want to pick on these three elements here in the slide, because these are very important building blocks for the further uh, greenhouse gas reduction measures that are being discussed within the IMO today. That is the SEMP, the Ship Energy Efficiency Management Plan, which is an obligation for ships to have on board since 2013. It's also a key tool for ships to implement the amendments that will enter into force on the 1st of November of this year on the CII, and I'll come back to that. The EDI design requirements for new build ships, again, something that has been in place since 2015 and has really put the yards across the world on an equal level in terms of um, uh, manufacturing ships uh, according to the highest energy efficiency requirements. EDI phase four, a discussion that we will start having in the IMO again soon on the next generation of new built ships. Then also the IMO fuel consumption data collection system similar to what is uh, in place also in Europe for the MRV, uh, for greenhouse gas monitoring mechanism. But of course, the IMO system covers the global fleet, meaning over 28,000 ships reporting their fuel consumption to, the, uh, to their flag administrations, which is then forwarded to the IMO. Again, a very powerful tool for the next set of measures, particularly when we start talking carbon pricing or economic measures in the IMO. Going back to 2018, the adoption of the IMO greenhouse gas strategy, a landmark decision for a global organization like the IMO. Every one of you here has heard of the strategy. It has been referred to many, many times since its adoption in 2018, but it was really the response of the IMO, the IMO member states to what happened in 2015 in Paris. Just to recap what's in that strategy, a vision, a long-term vision of phasing out greenhouse gas emissions from international shipping as soon as possible in this century. Very important, and I'll come back to that later. Continue to strengthen energy efficient design requirements, the EEDI phase four, but also other carbon intensity requirements. Reducing carbon intensity of the global food fleet by 40% compared to 2008. And the 2050, the current 2050 target, I have to say, of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by at least 50% by 2008. Again, on the table as we speak. Impacts on states need to be assessed, 
particularly of importance for many developing countries. And this strategy is to be revised by 2023. This was already agreed in 2018 when the strategy was adopted and we have actually embarked on this process. CII, um, EXI and SEMP, beautiful acronyms that um, actually add more acronyms to our beautiful list of acronyms in addition to the EDI, DCS, many others but crucial amendments that will enter into force on the 1st of November of this year. Regulatory requirements, binding regulatory requirements for the global fleet agreed last year in 2021 and now entering into force on the 1st of November, aimed at achieving the 40% energy efficiency reduction target by 2030, a goal-based requirement requiring ships both to take technical and operational measures to achieve a mandatory carbon intensity rating requirement. This rating from A to E will be assigned to every ship. The ship will get a document of compliance to be inspected in ports across the world and providing a very powerful and easy accessible tool for other players in the maritime value chain. And we can actually see already quite a shift in the interest among other players like ports, like charters, like cargo owners, like the financial sector in terms of what is this rating? What does it represent? What does it mean? What does it mean for me as a private company if I look in my scope free emissions of the maritime uh, transport segment of my uh, company GHG reduction profile? And just to give you a couple of um, newspaper clippings about how we see change already happening uh, on the back of the CII. It's really driving a different level of discussion within boardrooms of companies. And IMO often has been accused of non-transparent decision-making. I think the CII is a powerful tool that actually increases transparency. It has its flaws, like every regulatory requirement that has just been agreed, but it does actually allow for more discussions along the value chain and actually having this simple tool like your washing machine, like your car, that triggers attention from uh, the decision makers in different levels of the organizations. Moving back then to 2050, and particularly what we're doing within the IMO in order to make the decarbonization or the phasing out of greenhouse gas emissions happening and a reality from a global regulator perspective. We call it also the Ford Propulsion and Revolution. The future fuel mix, what is the uh, future port going to look like? I think we all have this question and I'm very much looking forward to what all of you are going to say about that. I can already tell you the IMO is not going to give you the answer. Our challenge as a global regulator in making happen, making sure that we do have a regulatory framework that allows and enables this transition a couple of key points which are of crucial importance for us as a global regulator. Our rules and regulations need to be technology and fuel neutral while based on their real climate impact. Life cycle analysis, as was mentioned by Maya in the introduction, I'll come back to that. We need to facilitate the global transition, I emphasize global, towards low carbon shipping. We need to encourage buyer regulation and policy instruments, both first movers, but at the same time, and here I come back to the 175 member states, we cannot put in place a system that over penalizes certain parts of the fleet, particularly the fleet serving developing countries. We need to bridge the current price gap between fossil fuels and low carbon alternatives. We want to put in place rapidly a harmonized global level playing field, and that requires involvement and inputs from all of us, not only governments, but also industry to avoid and minimize a patchwork of regional and national carbon pricing measures, double taxation that will just actually export the energy efficiency, the least energy efficient ships to developing countries. We need to ensure global access to affordable maritime transport services and access to the world markets for developing countries. And we need to minimize any disproportionately negative impacts on states. Easy. The good news is that we're actually making considerable progress. Of course, again, IMO is accused of often of being too slow, but if you know those of you who are involved in the negotiations on the various streams here on the slide can actually acknowledge that 
we're making progress on various fronts and good progress. I'll highlight some of those. The revision of the strategy, so setting out really the strategic pathway towards decarbonization. The safety framework of crucial importance for all of these fuels. And again, of course, bread and butter for the IMO to work on safety regulations. The fuel consumption data collection system, the IMO DCS, come back to that. Life cycle assessments to really have a fuel, a full carbon um, footprint of all the fuels that we're assessing and analyzing today. And then what we call midterm measures, including, but not exclusively, market-based measures, global market-based measures to bridge the price gap. So the revision of the strategy, um, again, the initial strategy was agreed in 2018. We agreed, member states agreed back then it would be revised by 2023, and we are on that uh, pathway towards the revision and define new targets for 2050 and possible intermediate years. You're probably aware that there is a very strong push, particularly in Europe, for phasing out greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, achieving zero or net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. And we see that push reinforced every day. Our sister organization, the ICAO, the International Regulator for International Aviation, only adopted actually last week a long-term aspirational net zero goal for 2050, increasing the pressure on the IMO. But at the same time, and this is probably not a surprise for many of you, there's still many countries within the IMO that are not in a position to, such, to support such a target. So negotiations on this transition and setting out the new pathway will continue in the coming year up to July 2023. What is emerging, though, is that there is a very uh, broad support for what is called a just and equitable transition, meaning that developing countries need to be part of the transition of greenhouse gas decarbonization for shipping. Other very important elements that will be discussed later this year in December in MEPC, and on which we have received quite a number of documents now, both from member states, from different groups of member states, from industry, from environment NGOs, is what kind of greenhouse gas emissions need to be included in the strategy? Is that only carbon or is that methane, ammonia slip? And do the targets for 2050 need to be equal or not? Do we need ship type or ship size specific or differentiated targets? Do, and I put a, 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 an article there, do bigger liner companies have to have stricter targets than other parts of the industry and do they need to lead the way towards decarbonization and make lower costs for smaller companies to be decided? Do we need to integrate maritime corridors? Again, a topic very much discussed today into the IMO regulatory framework to support first movers. Do we need to allow for out of sector compensation? How do we integrate onboard carbon capture offsetting outside of the maritime industry, all kinds of questions that we still need to answer in the coming basically eight months or a little bit more leading to July 2023. Very important and coming back to us from different international fora from the UN, the UNCCC convention, is the need to introduce or to recognize the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities, meaning again that those countries that have not contributed to climate change and an equal pace as developed countries, do they need to be covered? Do they need to be subject to the same requirements as developing countries? A very difficult topic for the IMO to deal with because of the flag neutral and the principles of equal treatment of global ships. Safety regulations, I won't dwell on it today, but again, it's really um, of crucial importance for creating certainty among the industry in uh, the alternative fuels being uh, assessed and discussed today. And, and again, I hope this will really feature also in the discussions today and the rest of the week. Of course, IMO has made progress. We had a CCC subcommittee meeting two weeks ago uh, where quite uh, good uh, steps were made in terms of hydrogen, batteries and other alternative fuels. The IMO data collection system, the fuel consumption uh, monitoring system of the IMO. Um, again, we have uh, agreed in the last session of the IMO MEPC to have a new work stream on the revision of the IMO data collection system. And, and uh, I have a slight suspicion we will receive a document from the EU 
uh, in that uh, regard about additional reporting parameters, cargo proxies maybe in the IMO data collection system. What is important though is that the IMO data collection system needs to be robust if we want to discuss midterm measures. Life cycle greenhouse gas emissions, well to wake emissions uh, in order to have the full carbon footprint of the fuels that we're uh, assessing today needs to be developed. So IMO needs to have a methodology to have an equal treatment of all the alternative fuels uh, in order to incentivize investments, to incentivize um, investment decisions, orders for new build ships in the right ships according to their full carbon footprint so of the fuels from a well-to-wake perspective. A correspondence group is working on these guidelines. Um, the EC is one of the coordinators of this correspondence group together with China and Japan, and they have done really a huge job, I have to say. Um, so again, also thanks to, to the colleagues here uh, in EMSA that are supporting the European Commission in this very important coordinator role of this correspondence group. It is expected that the work will be finalized on uh, maybe interim guidelines by July 2023. 20, uh, and then we will continue to look in all the different fuel pathways and feedstocks uh, that are coming our way. The last regulatory element that we're working on um, quite intensively, midterm measures. So these are the uh, next set of binding requirements of the IMO in order to really bridge the fuel price gap between fossil fuels and non-fossil fuels. But again, also to make sure that we have a regulatory framework that covers the entire fleet not just parts of the fleet, but the entire fleet. We have received quite a number of proposals, good proposals from different groups of member states, uh, not only developed countries, but also developing countries on how they see this IMO framework emerging and uh, advancing technical measures, both looking into um, the CII framework, so further enhancing that framework, a GHG fuel standard, uh, a proposal put forward by the EU member states, EDI phase four, already mentioned it, but also importantly, IMO actually at the last session agreed that economic measures will be part of its uh, basket of measures moving forward. And this again was quite a big step forward for the IMO, for IMO member states, those are familiar with past discussion, to agree that carbon pricing will be part of the next set of measures. Um, we need to assess the impacts of these draft measures to make sure that, again, there are no disproportionately negative impacts on developing countries. And hopefully we will start the process also after uh, the discussions in uh, the MEPC in July 2023. Next steps, I already mentioned those. Uh, December will be a very busy month for us, uh, but many of you as well who I think will be present in London for our first in-person session of the Intersessional Working Group and MEPC since 2019. It's going to be a long session, two weeks of negotiations, uh, but after that you will have a, a immediately a Christmas break. Then July 2023 is the uh, timeline set for the adoption of the revised strategy. So we will have a clear pathway by then on uh, the reduction targets for 2015 and possible intermediate targets. We will have a clearer picture of what will be the basket of midterm measures, those economic and technical measures I just mentioned. And we will initiate the first stage of the comprehensive impact assessment. And we should have a first uh, draft and a first set of guidelines on the LCAs providing legal certainty and a clear way forward for uh, investments in alternative fuels. So just to wrap up um, and also just to highlight one very other important element of the puzzle for us as a global regulator, but again an element where we need the input of all of you is exploring the opportunities in the decarbonization for developing countries. And I mentioned it a couple of times, but it is really for us one big challenge in order to get everyone, all the IMO member states, uh, to agree on the next set of measures. So we're looking particularly into what are the opportunities for developing countries in uh, renewable energy production. Many of the developing countries are sitting on abundant renewable energy sources, solar, wind, uh, tidal, 
Um, and we see actually quite a number of countries now putting themselves on the map as the future producers of renewable hydrogen uh, biofuels and really trying to, in that way, commercialize their uh, potential. And we as the IMO, we try to support these countries in that process, but we need everyone's support. Employment in a low carbon economy, again, figures here from our colleagues in the International Energy Agency of crucial importance for many developing countries who are afraid that they will miss out. They will be the ones that will lose out on jobs if we're moving to uh, you know, the construction and the uptake of alternative fuels that they won't be have access to or their uh, yards, their crew members won't be uh, familiar with to deal with. So again, we need to also emphasize what is the job cre creation potential of a low carbon economy in the developing world. So with that, um, thank you very much for again for this invitation and, and to be here in this house. Um, we have uh, discussions upcoming actually in the IMO later this week on Friday, where we have also an in-person and remote uh, symposium on the just and equitable transition. Many speakers lined up from different parts of the world, giving their views on what the just and equitable transition in decarbonization should look like. And uh, that will, of course, be interesting input for our negotiations later this year. Those of you who will be uh, at COP27 in Egypt starting in November, um, please join us as well for the event that we're organizing there together with our colleagues from the World Bank and UNCTAD on exploring opportunities for developing countries in renewable energy production. That event will also be live streamed. So if you're not in Egypt, then you can still join us uh, in that very important side event in the COP27. Thank you very much and looking forward to the rest of the discussions today. Thank you very much, Rul, for this uh, comprehensive overview about uh, what has been done and what are the next steps that are going to be quite demanding. Uh, but I liked very much what you said about the shipping being, uh, on one hand, the consumer and one hand, uh, on the other hand, enabler. So, of course, uh, it's a challenge, but also an opportunity, as uh, some of the slides you, slides you showed uh, give a clear message there. We will take the questions uh, at the end of this uh, um, first segment. Uh, and of course, I know that the chat is already quite lively and we will uh, use and give the opportunity to, to everybody to, to intervene. But now it's important also that, uh, that we start looking uh, at these uh, new studies uh, that we, uh, we are going to focus on in the um, first module of this uh, workshop. I wanted only to, to, to stress uh, that uh, you may have uh, seen that the structure and the focus that these studies are following are uh, quite similar because we tried to have a, an overview of uh, issues that uh, need to be looked at when we talk about uh, alternative sources of, of power. Then we, we have decided to start uh, from the state of play and of course, this is uh, the buzzwords that all of you know now about uh, production pathways, scalability, availability, sustainability and, sustain uh, and uh, suitability. And here we also looked at the economic dimension. As the rule said, there is a technical dimension, there is an economic dimension. And we looked also, uh, we tried to provide a cost analysis for new builds and retrofits. Then we looked at the analysis of the standards that exist and the regulations that are in place both at EU level, at international level, regional level. And again, here we tried to identify the gaps that exist and that can be an obstacle for the uptake of these fuels. And again, trying to build possible next steps in this perspective. And finally, we looked at the safety dimension. In each study, you will find uh, 
three specific uh, acid analysis that have been uh, uh, carried out with the specific uh, types of ships, uh, trying to cover uh, both the cargo ships and the passenger ships uh, with uh, a clear acid analysis and, of course, recommendations for, uh, again, possible further steps. The workshop will follow these teams. So we will have a presentation from our contractor that will set the, the scene and will share with you the findings of, of, of this analysis for both fuels. Then we will have a moment of sharing of experience because you heard the first movers as an expression quite used in the other presentations. There are already first movers that are experiencing in, uh, in, in their daily life what it means to, to work uh, already with these fuels. And then we will open the floor for discussion in this uh, double perspective, the findings of our studies and the concrete experience that is already in the field. Because, as Maya said, we need to move out of the first mover's perspective and we need to go into a more structural approach. The whole industry, the whole actors that are involved. We start with the first presentation. Mm -hmm. Uh, the consortium that uh, is going uh, to be represented by CEDEFT with this uh, presentation. And uh, we will focus exactly on what you see on the screen. The state of play, production pathways, availability, scalability and sustainability. And Jasper Faber from CEDEFT will uh, provide this first presentation. Jasper, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Manuela. Um, thank you also for our hosts here at EMSA, um, for uh, the clients for this study, for enabling us to do this very interesting study. Um, and good morning to, or afternoon, evening, for everybody um, joining online, and good morning for the people here in the room. Um, indeed, I'm going to uh, present uh, the, the highlights of, of what is in our two studies on um, production pathways, availability, scalability, and sustainability of both uh, biofuels and, um, and ammonia. Um, and uh, I'll start with uh, uh, biofuels, um, where I'll introduce the different production pathways, discuss availability and scalability, uh, also the sustainability uh, issues and then um, uh, conclude on biofuels and uh, I'll follow the same structure for ammonia and then reach an overall conclusion and um, as a spoiler um, I can already say that in, so in many aspects these two um, groups or types of fuels are very much each other mirror each other's mirror image um, uh, and uh, as I will make clear in the in the presentation so um, Starting with biofuels, um, there is a wide range of, um, of biofuels, um, which to some extent are currently already used in the, in the shipping sector, and um, which can, can replace basically all the conventional fuels that, um, uh, that the shipping sector currently uses. So, um, when you think about uh, the distillates or the, the marine gas oils, the marine diesels, um, they can be to uh, a larger or lesser extent um, be replaced by um, uh, biofuels like, uh, like FAME, HVO, um, currently not available but which may be available in the future, Fischer Trops diesel, um, uh, DME. Um, also, um, bioalcohols can to some extent um, uh, replace distillates. Fuel oils can be um, replaced to a, a larger or lesser extent by um, straight vegetable oil, SVO, pyrolysis oil, in which there is currently a lot of interest from many, um, many uh, sites. Uh, also, uh, HDL biocrude, so Volosis oil, um, LNG um, can can obviously be replaced by um, liquefied biomethane, uh, which is chemically 
uh, this almost the same as uh, as LNG and uh, methanol, uh, which is on a very small scale, also used in uh, in shipping nowadays. I think in the fourth IMO greenhouse gas study, we called it uh, the fastest grower, but very, from a very low base, um, which is currently mainly um, fossil methanol, can also be replaced by biomethanol. Um, the the um, uh, the interesting thing about biofuels is that many of the biofuels can be produced from a range of feedstocks with uh, se several production pathways. And in our report, you'll see many graphs like this one, where on the on the left hand side we introduce the feedstock uh, uh, groups, um, then uh, the production pathways. Uh, in the in the second column, then in the third column, uh, the biofuel that is produced, and in the uh, right hand column, uh, the conventional fuel that can be replaced um, again to a larger or lesser extent uh, by this uh, by this biofuel. And um, you see many arrows in this uh, uh, in this um, um, uh, graph um, representing that. For example, if you start from the uh, bot, uh, the top left, uh, oil crops can both be um, undergo transesterification to yield fame, but they can also be hydro treated to um, uh, to yield HVO, um, and you you could to some extent even um, subject them to gasification, although that is not uh, not, not currently done. Um, the the report provides a high level description of the production processes for. Um, 11 of the most promising biofuels. They include all the biofuels that are currently used, uh, but also the ones that uh, uh, that are often mentioned in um, uh, in biofuel studies and that are um, uh, to some extent uh, more scalable than um, uh, than some of the biofuels that are currently used today. Um, it, it will be obvious that that I won't have the time, and and you will probably be very bored if I go over them. Uh, uh, in detail, um, so I just refer to the report. Um, as I stated already, uh, there are many pathways available uh, Ed, to produce biofuels from uh, a range of feedstocks. Um, and uh, the currently more developed pathways, um, like the pathways that uh, uh, um, uh, produce uh, FAME or HVO, uh, tend to provide less greenhouse gas reduction potential than uh, more advanced pathways that are emerging. Um, some of the more promising pathways still require further development and more promising um, meant in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction potential and also scalability. Um, and especially and I think that's on the on the oh yeah that's on the next slide. Um, the the more um, promising pathways are often based on um, lignocellulosic or algae uh, feedstocks, of which there is more and which are more scalable than the carbohydrates and bio oils and fats which are currently available. In principle, when you look at the global supply of uh, sustainable biomass um, and uh, the, the especially the term sustainable is quite a fuzzy concept and is is hard to put exact numbers to, but um, the um, the uh, studies point to an availability uh, globally of uh, of biomass in the order of um, uh, forty to uh, one hundred maybe one hundred twenty exajoules of uh, biomass per year that can be produced globally. If you compare that to the energy demand from shipping, um, 18 exajoules in, uh, in 2018, uh, probably a little bit more today, but I, I wouldn't even know if we're up to 20 already and, uh, uh, and, and we may never reach 20 uh, because of the, um, uh, of the effort to, um, to improve the energy efficiency of shipping. Um, you can con could conclude that there's more than enough biofuels. But um, of course, the biofuel availability for the maritime sector is not only um, determined by the, the global 
sustainable biomass potential, but uh, also by the availability of feedstocks, which is the uh, sustainable biomass potential, but certainly also uh, by the competition with other sectors, because uh, many sectors have set their eyes on um, biomass for their decarbonization pathways. The availability of the feedstocks, as we also explain in the report, depend on sustainability criteria. Um, and so the, the tighter or the more stringent the sustainability criteria are, um, obviously, uh, the lower the supply of, uh, of biomass feedstock, but also the type of feedstock. And I already mentioned that lignocellulosic, so a woody uh, biomass and, and algae, um, tend to have a higher um, potential than, um, uh, let's say, food and fodder crops or um, uh, uh, residues of that uh, in the form of carbohydrates and um, uh, bio-oils and fats. And the competition with other sectors depends very much on uh, the alternative sources um, that these other sectors have, but is also to uh, some extent policy driven. Uh, so it depends on the policies with, and the pressure that the policies put on various sectors to decarbonize. Um, and um, uh, uh, we explored that a little bit in the study, but of course in a study focusing on um, uh, the use of biofuels in, in marine, it goes beyond the scope of the study to fully explore uh, that issue. When we look at the sustainability of, um, of biofuels, um, it's clear to say that the, the tank to wake emissions uh, are quite clear. Right? You can look at the chemical formula of the, of the various biofuels and calculate what the combustion CO2 emissions are. Um, of course, we're, uh, we're not using uh, biofuels for uh, what they emit, but we, we're using biofuels because in, uh, in the grow, growth of the feedstock, um, uh, CO2 is uh, taken out of the atmosphere and, uh, and put in the plant. So there's a, a short cycle variation which leads to greenhouse gas reductions. Um, on this, um, let's say the well to tank, um, which you see in the, the uh, bottom left graph here, there is a lot of variation. Um, uh, it depends very much on where the feedstock is grown, which type of feedstock is grown, etc. etc. Um, in some, uh, in, in many cases, uh, the overall balance is, um, uh, is well, yeah, I, I'm, I'm struggling whether to use the word positive or negative, but in, in any case, uh, the overall balance is that the uh, uh, well to wake. Uh, emissions are lower than uh, the fossil fuel alternative that they replace, um, uh, but but uh, very few biofuels can can be made in a fully carbon neutral way. That depends on um, emissions during uh, production, but also, and that is the most uncertain um, estimate in this whole um, uh, in this whole analysis, the in the emissions stemming from indirect land use change which are on the right hand side, which can be quite high and indirect land use change in very simple words basically means that if you um, extend the area for uh, where you grow, uh, uh, let's say, uh, 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 some kind of, of woody biomass uh, to, to make, um, um, uh, to turn into um, uh, uh, biofuel, um, you, you indirectly um, induce uh, land use change elsewhere that will then be used, for example, to, to um, grow feed or fodder crops um, and where um, uh, carbon emissions are, uh, uh, where, where carbon emissions result from. Um, and this pressure on, on land area um, can have quite significant impact on, um, uh, on the overall emissions. Um, you also see that in the in the left hand side graph where some of the emissions and I think palm oil and, and soy are obvious examples that are have been in the press uh, where the overall emissions if you take indirect lens use change into account then can be significantly higher than the emissions from the fossil fuel that replace and one of the reasons to have sustainability criteria for uh, biomass is of course to eliminate the worst types of biofuels uh, from being used as a way to dec decarbonize the sector. 
So to summarize, um, uh, when you classify the, the biofuels into two groups, one based on uh, sugar, sugar starches and, uh, and vegetable oils and the other on lignocellulosic inputs and, and algae, we can say that the, the maturity, uh, technical maturity, but also the, the market readiness of the first group is, uh, is very good. Those are the fuels that are uh, currently used in the shipping sector. And um, of the, the second group, the lignocellulosic and algae group is less. Um, although uh, virtually all observers um, reckon that uh, they will be uh, technically mature by uh, 2030 if they aren't already so uh, now. It is just that they are not fully commercialized yet. The current availability of the first group is high and of the second group is low, but the greenhouse gas reduction potential of lignocellulosic and algae biomass is higher and also the scalability of those uh, fuels are higher. So ideally you would want to have a policy in place that um, uh, transfers from the if if biofuels are considered to be a, a decarbonization option that transfers from the, the from the biofuels that are currently used towards um, uh, biofuels on the basis of lignocellulosic inputs and algae moving on to uh, ammonia the other fuel that we or the fuel that we studied in in our other report um, we identified five production pathways but um, uh, to be honest, only one is, is really technically mature. Um, we focus on green ammonia, eh? so um, uh, uh, because this, these are um, um, uh, decarbonization studies. Um, and the um, uh, ammonia production, of course, is, is happening uh, all over the world. Uh, it is uh, in the Haber-Bosch process, so-called Haber-Bosch uh, process. Uh, nitrogen from the air is combined with hydrogen to produce ammonia. Uh, this hydrogen in the current ammonia plants often comes from um, uh, steam reformed methane or steam reformed other types of fossil fuels. And in the, um, uh, for green uh, ammonia, this hydrogen would have to be generated with renewable electricity from uh, fresh water. That is um, a pathway number one at the top of the screen. There are um, uh, four other pathways that have a different, or three other pathways, sorry, that have a different way of um, uh, producing the, uh, the hydrogen, um, either from direct uh, solar hydrogen production, um, still very much in a, uh, in the development stage or biogenic hydrogen production, then you can bypass the uh, Haber-Bosch synthesis process by uh, what is called non-thermal plasma synthesis. Um, it's explained in the in the report. Uh, also, still very much uh, uh, under undergoing technical uh, development, and there's even a way to combine uh, renewable electricity, fresh water, and air and directly in a, uh, an electrochemical uh, ammonia synthesis produce green ammonia. As I said, uh, the first process is, is technically mature. Um, uh, all, the, all the other or the other four processes are uh, still undergoing development. Um, the um, efficiency of the of the various processes, uh, the Haber Bosch process, um, uh, about a little bit over seventy percent of the energy you put into it ends up as chemical energy of the uh, of the ammonia molecule. Um, pathway uh, two, direct solar hydrogen production, currently has a very low efficiency, but expectations are that it can compete with um, uh, with the Haber Bosch process. Um, uh, and that is also true for the electrochemical ammonia synthesis. The other processes, at least the current expectations that their overall efficiency would be a little bit lower. Currently around the world, um, for uh, there about uh, uh, 230, 240 million tons of, of uh, ammonia is produced, mainly for the fertilizer industry. Um, we, we have tracked in our report also announcements of, uh, of plants making green or in some cases blue ammonia. Um, and they uh, 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 
add up to 133 megatons per year if they would all um, uh, be realized. Now that is very much a question. Um, some of these initiatives um, are, are announcement of feasibility studies um, uh, and, and only in very few cases um, actual investment decisions have been taken. But this shows at least that there is an interest from a wide range of stakeholders in a wide range of countries to produce green ammonia. Um, challenges for using this ammonia in the marine sector are that somewhat like the uh, biomass, uh, many sectors will have demand for green or, or blue ammonia and uh, maybe even more pressing that the green electricity that you need to produce green ammonia will also be in very high demand. And where this green electricity ends up, eh, whether it's just fed into the grid uh, or used to produce green ammonia uh, or for other purposes, very much depends on, uh, on policy, um, uh, many of which are still uncertain. Um, and um, the, the, uh, as, as we said, the green production needs to be efficient, uh, utilized at maximum capacity, and this also poses challenges with regards to location, pipelines, and if you want to use it in shipping, access to ports, um, and um, especially when you have intermittent sources of, um, uh, of uh, electricity, um, you need to oversize your capacity in order uh, with uh, in relation to the to the actual production because you cannot access the green electricity all the time. So the challenge, the the the, the largest challenge for uh, pro producing or upscaling ammonia is uh, uh, green uh, electricity. There are also certification issues there. Um, uh, for example, if you feed in uh, green electricity in the grid and take it out somewhere else. Um, uh, do you count it as green or is it not green? Should you use the grid average? Uh, those are all issues that are uh, probably uh, going to be solved for the maritime sector, at least in our uh, LC in the IMO LCA guidelines. Um, hopefully so. Um, and um, also transportation of uh, ammonia, if the, if it's not decarbonized, might also lead to. Uh, um, uh, to an increased footprint. When we compare ammonia uh, on the right-hand uh, part of this slide with um, uh, fuel oils or gas oils, uh, the second column, or LNG, the, the third column on a number of um, uh, emissions uh, to, uh, to air, we find that in general um, uh, ammonia uh, in used in an internal combustion engine will have lower emissions uh, with the possible except, exception of, uh, of NOx, uh, ammonia and uh, nitrous oxide. And um, I say possible except, uh, exception um, as uh, speakers after me will also inform you, um, the ammonia engine is very much under development and also, the after-treatment uh, technology is being developed, so it's uh, it maybe those orange and red uh, cells here can be turned into green um, uh, following uh, further um, uh, technical development. Other environmental impacts of um, uh, of ammonia are that uh, the uh, production of hydrogen requires pure uh, uh, the, the ionized water, fresh water, and uh, the amount of this amount of fresh water can increase water scarcity. Um, desalinization is a solution, but also has uh, can have um, uh, uh, impacts on the on the local environment. Um, generating green electricity will require a lot of land. Um, at least for solar and uh, and onshore wind, um, and uh, and this land, of course, should avoid using land currently used for crops or for for other purposes. We included here some areas in the world that, according to various analyses, um, are particularly suitable for either solar or uh, or wind energy. 
and there are some um, some areas, uh, notably China, Australia, uh, Ch Chile, sorry, uh, Australia, uh, where the two are combined, and which may uh, provide the best locations for production of uh, of green hydrogen and then also uh, green ammonia. Um, one thing that that um, we should uh, draw particular attention to is the risk of ammonia spills because ammonia uh, when dissolved in water can be harmful to marine life and there's certainly a need for further evaluation and also taking contingency measures uh, when we uh, put ammonia ships uh, on the ocean. Um, so to conclude on ammonia, uh, the maturity of the production pathway is, uh, is very good. The current availability of green ammonia is low. Um, uh, the, the greenhouse gas reduction potential is high. It can all, uh, virtually be um, produced at a, a zero uh, greenhouse gas impact and also be used on a well-to-wake basis with zero impact. And the scalability is high, but it all depends on investments and investments will only come when the right policies are in place. The overall conclusion of our, these two studies are that um, uh, most low carbon fuels used in maritime shipping uh, today are bio-based and produced from vegetable oils. The scalability of these fuels is low and also their um, greenhouse gas emission reductions are limited. Um, that also means that effective decarbonization of marine transport requires, amongst others, a shift from those biofuels to biofuels from lignocellulosic biomass or algae um, and green ammonia and maybe also other fuels that were not in the scope of these two studies, but maybe in the scope of uh, uh, further studies that we're um, doing. Um, the technical challenges for the fuels that we studied in these two studies are surmountable. The TRLs for the production of green ammonia and lignocellulosic biofuels are high uh, or are projected to reach eight, nine, have full technical maturity by uh, 2030. The financial challenges also appear to be surmountable, at least you could derive that from the number of projects in the pipeline for green ammonia production. Um, and also, uh, we didn't explore that pipeline in, in that much detail in our report, but uh, the, the pipeline for projects on um, uh, lignocellulosic uh, biofuels um, is also quite good. And the main remaining challenges are um, the availability of green electricity and a stable policy framework. And on that note, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this overview. So we have put the first piece of the puzzle, okay? We have looked at the state of play as concerns, of course, uh, the production, <laughs> the availability, and uh, of course, uh, there are some important elements that come uh, up, also the dimension of the competition with other sectors. We also focused on sustainability mm, in terms of the information that is uh, now available. We will continue to look at the other pieces of the puzzle that include the regulatory gaps, that include the economic dimension, the cost dimension, and final, the safety dimension. Because as I said, this is a puzzle that needs to be composed. So we will arrive at the end of this module where we will have a full picture of all these aspects. Uh, we break now for coffee, uh, 15 minutes. We will be back at 11.30 with the, some sharing of experience. And then we will have the interaction of this first part of uh, the um, analysis. Thank you.
Welcome back in the room and online. Uh, we start now with some sharing of experience with the, the first movers that uh, have already engaged themselves. And the first uh, focus is the fuel supplier uh, perspective. We are very happy to have uh, with us uh, Alex Revans, uh, Senior Policy and Advocacy Advisor at Shell. And uh, they will um, share with us a bit of their direct experience uh, in relation to alternative fuels and in particular ammonia, if I understood well. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I would just like to um, thank EMSA for giving us the opportunity to uh, present today and give a perspective from um, a a marine fuel supplier um, regarding you know how we see alternative fuels developing and power solutions over over time um, i think from the supply side we can see um, quite a lot of, of changes happening um, and as shell is a a major marine fuel supplier um, we also operate a large number of, of vessels so we can see um, from a, a vessel operator perspective um, you know how different fuels and, and different bits of uh, legislation will potentially be affecting our business but also um, we have a, a, a lot of interest in uh, technology development as well so really trying to understand not only the future fuels and how they can be used and um, will be used but also how they um, will work actually on vessels and how the um, the bunkering and distribution of, of the fuels will will work. Um, so I think the decarbonisation of the maritime industry is important to us. Um, as an organisation, we've made a commitment to um, decarbonise, and that's been published. So I think you know we we want to you know. Um, work with the industry in, in collaboration with our, our customers and other partners to to push forward on you know how how these alternative fuels can be brought into into use um, if I just go to the first slide a lot of words here um, I'm <laughs> required to, to look at this but I think the the um, the summary of this is um, uh, this presentation is not used for um, investment purposes so um, I'll uh, move on. I just wanted to start with a, a bit of a broader look at um, the energy transition and really look at it from a, a refining perspective to start with. Um, obviously, the, the majority of marine fuels being used today um, are fossil and we come in from, from refineries. Um, I think this this graph just gives us a, a little bit of a, a view that um, the refining capacity is actually shrinking or starting to shrink. Um, and that's due to changes in legislation, changes in um, a lot of the, the transport requirements that are, that are slowly happening. And also people looking ahead to um, changing refineries into um, facilities that can be used for other energy sources and other fuel types. Um, so the, the fossil um, fuels will be migrated out of the out of facilities um, and moving towards more renewable and, and, and sustainable um, feedstocks over time. And then we can't really look at shipping without looking at the other sectors. I think a lot of um, the previous speakers have, have talked about um, how the other sectors um, are working. So when we talk about the other sectors, I suppose for, for transport, we're looking at heavy road, light road, um, and aviation are the main ones. And the, the graph I've presented here is really just showing you not necessarily how we expect the the fuel mix to change over time, but just, you know, how we expect the, the 
the powertrains and the drivetrains to to change over time. So you can see that you know people are, are projecting that you know hydrogen could come in, electricity, um, gaseous fuels as well. Um, so things are projected to change. This this figure may be uh, sort of um, changed as things um, develop. I mean, we're seeing a very strong um, development of. Uh, in the electric sector and whether electrification can happen for um, some of the larger vehicles on the roads um, and I think that's also something we can um, talk about potentially for for the short haul shipping as well so we can see that as things change the the, the need for different types of fuels could potentially change over time and if we start moving towards more um, electrification for road, which is by far the largest sector in the transport side of things, a lot of the what has been earmarked maybe um, could become available to other sectors for use. So things like um, fame and, and some of the other biofuels that are already used. Sort of taking a bit longer. Oops. So when we looked at how the, the fuels may change over time, um, we've called it, well, internally we use the, the term a mosaic. Um, it sort of gives an indication that um, initially at least there'll be a number of, of different op options that are available. We've, we've seen uh, uh, presentations previously on um, some of the different types of, of uh, fuels, the bio and um, ammonia that's um, been presented um, previously. But if we look across all of the um, different types of vessels um, that are used in, this is really, really focusing on the, the, the deep sea fleet, we can see that, you know, fuel oil is the predominant, predominant fuel that's, that's used today or, or liquid um, fossil is the predominant fuel of the of the day um, with um, uh, fuel oils and, and um, gas oils um, we've also got a, a small amount of LNG starting to come into the um, uh, to the mix um, and we're seeing that you know there's a, a, a fairly strong um, take up of, of LNG as a fuel um, but then, you know, what are the other options that we're seeing today? Um, we've talked about bio. The, the main thing about bio is we can see, you can see from um, some of these lines that where they overlap, we can see that, you know, there's there's the potential for, for dropping of different types of fuels into existing mixes. So we can change the, the overall mix of fuels, go to, you know, I mean, for, for road and things like that, we've seen B10, B... Uh, B20, um, but also for for shipping, there's the potential to to drop some of these fuels in to reduce the the carbon intensity of fossil um, as we transition through. Because with the the ships having a long um, a long life, um, it'll be down to whether we can actually decarbonize the 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 fossil. Um, versions um, in situ or whether there's a retrofit um, that is um, economic to do to change to to different fuels um, and as we see green hydrogen um, coming on stream um, there'll be small amounts we believe available starting you know in the 2020s and and growing and but how the, the different sectors will will take that up, I think, is something that still needs to be um, evaluated. But we can see that by the 2030s, some of these um, green hydrogen will be more available and, uh, and available for other fuels to be to be um, generated, um, like the uh, synthetic fuels like methanol and, and ammonia, uh, methanol and uh, LNG, but also um, potentially green um, ammonia and things like that. So um, as we, you can see from this, there's a number of different options, um, how we actually can work within the constraints of the different 
fuels that are available today, how they can be scaled, what is um, available for scaling, um, I think is something that is developing over time. And the previous presentation gave an idea of, of what sort of volumes of biomaterials could be made available into the into the shipping industry. So we can see that today um, the availability of things like um, uh, fame and eucomian that can be dropped in as a, a fuel, it can be used as a, a mix or a 100% um, a, a, a has been um, trialed and, and shown to be effective. But as we move forward, there's things like um, HVO could be, become available as a, a solution um, and other um, fuels like synthetic diesels as we move forward as the availability and the cost of, of green hydrogen and um, other things are, are reduced over time. So in, in terms of which ones are available, I think we've seen this, this figure a number of times, but I, I, at the, this point in time, um, what could be used uh, is, is important to understand versus what ultimately will you know, make it through to being a, a, an acceptable uh, fuel of, for for the maritime industry. Um, excuse me. So we can see from from this slide that not all fuels are in the in the same um, state of readiness. Um, we can see that you know some of the biofuels uh, are available. They're available at a reasonable scale into the market. They're readily used in or already used um, in uh, places like road transport. So things like fame. Um, and then as we move across, we see the readiness um, sort of reduce um, in terms of what uh, can be used in terms of the, the engine technologies. Um, the first three columns, you know, indicate that there are a number of fuels that are available. Um, and as a, a, a fuel supplier, we are supplying um, biofuels into um, into to shipping and taking advantage of um, local uh, uh, incentives. Um, also looking at trialing things like bio LNG into um, vessels and uh, interested in, you know, what the opportunities are around um, methanol as well um, as we go forward. So it's in terms of the sectoral demand and the availability, those are likely to be the, the key things, you know, the demand will pull the supply or generally pulls the supply through the, the process. But there's certain things within this that could um, uh, affect how these fields are taken up. So not only from, um, you know, other vessels, are the engines available, but also, are you know, have we been through the the due diligence in terms of how the, the the fuels have been evaluated for safety and sort of moved beyond the um, the the hazard identification into more how would you in reality um, manage these these hazards and, and put forward um, concrete uh, processes to to make sure the hazards are, are managed. Um, <clears throat> and if you look at at biofuels, as I've said, you know, successful trials. We've done successful trials with, with, with fame. We're looking at um, uh, LNG as a, a fuel. The the main things we're finding is, you know, the the cross sectoral competition, um, and also bring in um, sustainable feedstocks into um, places where they can be aggregated for production, um, especially for. Uh, bio LNG use of um, the integrated gas grid and being able to mass balance across the grid helps 
bring those dispersed sources um, together um, more readily and allow scaling to, to happen. Um, as we've seen, there's a, there's a lot of bio feedstocks available. It's really, can they be made available to shipping and, and can they be aggregated and, and brought in a cost-effective way into, um, into a fuel production site? When we talk about bio, I think that the main thing that we're we're uh, seeing is the the sustainability criteria, making sure that you know we want to use sustainable feedstocks. Um, and as we can see, that in Europe there's a there's a fairly uh, um, uh, slightly mature the, the the sustainability criteria, and we've already um, heard from the IMO around you know the work that they're doing looking at um, life cycle impacts and and how sustainability could be um in uh, incorporated into the a global um approach and when we talk about feedstocks there's are a number that are are available the the, the carbon intensity as we've seen differs and you know it's how easy they are to to bring into the market and to convert into a, a a material that can be used in a in a vessel, um, and I think the uh, our view at, of around bio is that um, there will be a solution, um, one of the solutions um, that can be used, but we feel that it won't be the the only solution, and further fuels will be required, and this is where we come on to. Um, hydrogen and the hydrogen based base fuels um, and when we start looking at some of these there some of them are not dropping solutions ammonia and and uh, hydrogen as a, a as a um, in its uh, raw form um, would require vessel um, modifications so um, the technology from the OEMs and, and the, the vessel um, development would need to change. Um, but as you move to more drop-in solutions, they become a lot more energy intensive to actually generate and you start putting a lot more energy in um, to create those the things like synthetic fuels and, and um, that would be synthetic methanol, synthetic methane and uh, potentially synthetic diesels. The uh, the demand or the, the the criteria that that is in a lot of people's minds is around the the energy density. We've already heard that mentioned a couple of times, um, and this is where you know we're strong supporters of energy efficient technologies, bringing in um, new energy converters, things like fuel cells, and we're doing a, a lot of work on on um, trying to marinize. Uh, fuel cells, solid oxide, solid oxide and, and PEMS um, to provide that extra efficiency to make some of these um, less energy dense fuels um, become a reality for for um, the, the longer haul vessels. So you can see from this graph that hydrogen and hydrogen derived fuels per sector uh, is expecting to, to grow and the transport sector and marine um, is going to be part of, of uh, that. Obviously, you know, industry and, and is going to take up the, the majority and uh, other sectors within, within transport will, will take up quite a lot as well. So you can see there'll be this, this, um, this cross-sectorial uh, um, competition that will be going on. And we see that the you know to, to build that capacity and to build the the hydrogen um, can't be just done by shipping alone so the the infrastructure for for um, hydrogen and hydrogen derived fuels will need to be based around you know how hydrogen and, and the energy for hydrogen will be transported we've, we've heard just briefly uh, earlier on about um, countries like uh, Chile being a, a potential source of some of the green hydrogen and then it's how do we transport um, that energy around the world and, and make it available to 
um, other regions and, and across the sectors. So it's the interplay between how hydrogen itself could be transported as a liquid versus how it could be transported as a, a uh, another form such as ammonia um, and that being used as a, a major energy um, carrier in itself. So I think how that happens um, as, a, as an organization shall are, are working um, on trying to understand both of those um, different fuels as energy carriers um, and we've done quite a lot of work with the transport of, of liquid hydrogen with a vessel that now runs um, or has run from Australia to, to Japan to, to transport liquid hydrogen in bulk. Um, so we can see that things need to be tested and tried um, but there's also the wider aspects of, of the energy um, supply chain that we require to scale um, hydrogen-based fuels and, and the use of some of these things. So if we can piggyback off, say, liquid hydrogen, if that's been used as the main form of transport, uh, transporting of the energy, then that will give us um, a boost in terms of the available infrastructure at ports and other places. And similarly, if ammonia takes off, so it's um, a case of seeing which ones of those become predominant um, for liquid hydrogen, I and mean, if we come back to, to liquid hydrogen, you know, the, there's a, a lower energy density. So we're talking about, you know, needing, uh, to make sure that energy efficiency and, and the, the converter efficiency, uh, is improved. It also has a very low, um, low temperature it has to be carried at. So, um, that becomes, um, a difficult, uh, element to, to manage and also that the liquefaction requires a, a lot of energy. The, the conversion and the reconversion of, of some of these materials um, will have a significant role in which one becomes a, vi a viable cost option in the future. If we're thinking of ammonia, there's a, there's a big cross-sectoral demand um, with regard to fertilizer production. So you can see that there's a potential that that could drag through um, supply um, that could be piggybacked on. Um, but we have, um, we're still waiting for, you know, s some good signals to show that the energy technology, also the engine technologies are developing, but also the, the safety concerns around um, not only the environmental elements, but also the, the use on board and um, the, the wider bunkering risks are, can be um, effectively managed. Uh, and as has been mentioned, the regulation, we believe that the regulation is one of the, the key drivers that will, will ultimately result in um, the selection of fuels and making them more available. Um, as has already been said, uh, the alternative fuels are more expensive than uh, the, the fossil equivalents. And so therefore we need a, a level playing field to, to drive that. And we need that on a, a global basis. With that in mind, we did a little bit of a, a, a study to look at, you know, how, how mandates could affect the, the supply of, um, fuels, uh, within the EU, um, and looked at it from a, a supply and demand. Uh, perspective. If we just focus on the, the fuel oil vessels, which are the, the left-hand side of the, the, the chart here, um, what we were trying to understand is what would it require a a, um, a ship owner or a ship operator to, to do to comply with uh, fuel EU maritime versus what is potentially required for a, a marine fuel supplier under under red and sort of seeing how that would um, look and, and what the potential effects could be. Um, I think the, the easiest thing to, to show is, is the bottom two, two graphs here. Um, you can see that for compliance with, with fuel EU maritime, um, a, sh a ship operator would, could bring in biodiesel or a, a bio component that that meets um, 
the the red annex 9b requirements um, but for a, a, a marine fuel supplier um, there's a requirement to potentially put in some RFMBO, some advanced biofuels that could be slightly more expensive and also a potential need to, to top up with um, first generation biofuels which are not allowed under, under fuel EU maritime. Um, so I think what we're saying with this graph is really that, you know, the, the supply and demand are important and they need to be balanced in the, in the, in the legislation to make sure that we're not disadvantaging um, the fuel supply or the, or the demand side um, in any way because uh, it could lead to an imbalance and with fuel EU maritime it allows for vessels to, to bunker um, elsewhere in the world you know, and that could potentially impact on, on how the, the European market could um, develop. So I think I'd like to leave it there and just say the, in terms of how we uh, um, invest and what um, makes the investment case, it's the regulator in cert uh, certainty um, and that helps de-risk the investments going forward and making sure that we've got a, a good level playing field that allows um, uh, everyone to, to play their part um, and ultimately it'll be you know how the the marine sector fares against the other sectors you know and and what pulls um, some of these alternative fuels into the marine sector so I'd like to to uh, leave it there thank you very much Thank you very much for having shared the perspective of a fuel supplier. And it's clear with the last slide that the demand and supply need to meet at a certain point. And that there are for sure a lot of challenges, both in terms of technical dimension, economic dimension, and safety dimension, at least for some options that will need to be looked at. Another very important perspective is the port's perspective. And uh, here we are very happy to have uh, with us uh, Mercedes de Juan from uh, the Port of Valencia. And uh, she will share with us uh, their experience. Mercedes, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to, to thank ENSA for inviting us to share our perspective about this issue and uh, in particular to Mercedes for her keen support at any time. Uh, my name is Mercedes de Juan. I am working for Fundación Valencia Por, and this vision and this perspective has been prepared in close cooperation with Fernando Jimeno. Fernando Jimeno is the head of safety at the Poro Valencia. Uh, as I mentioned before, I am working for uh, Fundación Valencia Por. Fundación Valencia Por is a research center that is working in the main areas that uh, are covered in a port, from the marketing side uh, to the safety and security, sustainability, uh, integration between port and cities, etc., etc. We have a close uh, relationship and traditional cooperation with uh, important ports in uh, Latin America. And uh, we have uh, stress in the cooperation also with ports in uh, North Africa and Middle East countries. Well, um, from the point of view of the, of the, um, of the ports, the, avail the availability and the scalability is not the main issue because uh, ports are obliged to, to grant a supplier but the main concern is related to the safety, the safety of a operation, in particular the bankering. The bankering is one of the most risk operations that uh, happens in the current operation of a vessel. And uh, it's something in we need to put uh, much more the focus. If we look, uh, this is an overview of the, of the most important or most promising uh, alternative fuels, in particular related to, to the issues uh, or the connections to the safety, we are going to put the focus on ammonia. Ammonia uh, could be directly used on uh, internal combustion engines, or could be used as an hydrogen carrier for being used in fuel cells. 
has several advantages being the most important of uh, them that uh, the volume requested for the tanks is approximately half uh, half of the, the volume requested by the hydrogen, the liquid hydrogen. When, when we look at the maturity of the technologies uh, for being installed on board, biodiesel in general is a quite mature technology. However, the ammonia uh, requests additional developments. This is a wall overview of uh, the characteristics or uh, every uh, alternative fuel always compared with the, the traditional fuels. Biofuels uh, present uh, important advantages in terms of technological maturity and energy density, as well requires uh, a small investment for adapting the existing vessels. And when we talk at the issue of the safety, it doesn't involve any additional risk uh, compared with the traditional fuels. However, when we look to the ammonia, ammonia has an important advantage in terms of reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, but uh, present an important constraints related to the toxicity. Enter much more in depth when we are talking about to the will to wake uh, emissions. Uh, Ammonia is a promising option, in particular when the ammonia is coming from urban waste. It provides a significant reduction of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. The flammability risk is very narrow and uh, doesn't represent a, a, a real uh, or a, a highly potential risk and can be stored on board as a liquid in a practical pressure and temperature. Uh, other advantage, other important advantage, is that it has a well-established um, worldwide logistic chain in this moment. Then it's more easy to, to provide worldwide ammonia than uh, biofuels. However, when we enter in the, the disadvantages, the most important is the toxicity. The second one is that it's highly explosive in combination with some allogens, interallogens, and oxidizers. Uh, this is also connected to, with the lack of a proper regulation, a specific regulation for using the ammonia on, on vessels, both for fueling the vessels and in the bunker in barge. Uh, it's also, well, there are constraints related to, to the fuel infrastructure for, for providing infrastructure at the port. However, it's quite easy to adapt the actual LNG carriers for being used as a bunkering vessel, but uh, also has other potential uh, constraints related to the increase of the NOx emissions and the possible ammonia sleep. As mentioned before, uh, ammonia presents also opportunities. Uh, uh, we believe that in the medium term is a realistic option for replacing fossil fuels mm -hmm. and contributing to the implementation of the IMO and Fit for 55 regulations. This is in this moment are at an early stage, then we have in time to, to, to include the vision of the, of the ports in the implementation of ammonia, in particular related to the, the ammonia bunkering uh, regulations and, and, and constraints. Uh, the vision of the ports will be, should be shared with the main shipping industry, shipyards, shipping companies, etc. Uh, in order to adapt the design of the vessels to the need of the ports and not in the backwards, which is something that uh, is, is impose additional constraints in the operation of the vessels. When we are talking about the challenge, the main challenge is that uh, in this moment ammonia is not covered by the IGF 
or the IGC codes. Then, this obliges to move to the alternative design provision. Uh, the colleague from NIMO uh, said that this is intending to provide some guidelines. I'm not so sure if uh, guidelines are uh, sufficient or we need to work in a new code because we are trying to apply a regulation that has been developed for a substance that in case of relays uh, provoke a flammable cloud that rapidly rise with a substance that is highly toxic and the tent is to keep in the ground. The second constraint is related to the, to the energy density. The ammonia requests higher volumes of uh, fuel than the time spent in the, in, uh, during the bunkering is higher and increase the risk associated to the bunkering operations. In this moment, at PORS, we are uh, applying regulation that has been developed for the industry, not for the PORS. And the PORS also impose is specific um, constraints, a specific situation that has not been taken into account when, when this industrial regulation has been developed. Then it's necessary to develop safety standards that will be adapted to the reality of the PORS. At, uh, which is quite obvious that uh, never the economic cost criteria must prevail over the safety of the poor and the poor staff and the crew. Well, the poor uh, cover a world uh, or, or has the world vision of the activities that are taken in the poor. Then, when we are talking about bunkering, it's necessary to consider the interest and the situation of the bunkering vessel, the fueled vessel, the, uh, the activities that are taken uh, in the terminal uh, operator, other operations that are taken at uh, the same place in the, in, at the same time in the port, and something that is much more on the focus now than uh, in the past, the relation between the port and the city. Well, the relation, this relation between the poor and the city is based on the confidence that uh, the operation taken in the poor are intrinsically safe. Then the people that is living around the poor has the perception that everything that is taking place in the poor is under control. Uh, one of the issues that causes more alarm in the population is the smell to ammonia. When the, uh, the people start to smell, try start to complain, and something like this. But it's not only related to the to the, the people that is work is living around the poor. It's also related to the perception of the stevedores. The stevedores, um, we are concerned about the the load and uh, load operations, and that will lead to to complain, protests, and strikes. Then. For providing the in-bankering services uh, at a port, it's necessary that the population do not perceive that any bankering operation is taking place. Instead, in emergency or in case of an accident, any emissions uh, of ammonia should be released to the atmosphere or to the harbor waters. In case of an, any, any, or in case of an accident, the vessel involved must have uh, enough safety devices for eliminating or mitigating the consequences over the health of the people and uh, well, basically over the health of the people and also over the, um, the environment. Entering in depth in the alternative design provision, we need to look for the equilibrium between the cost the safety and something that is important, the poor morphology. When we are talking about the poor morphology, we are talking about that the distance between the population and several uh, keys at the port of Valencia is uh, 500 meters. The distance is very short. In other ports, the situation is different. But uh, well, the, the idea of the alternative design provision is assuring that uh, the design 
has the same level of uh, safety uh, if uh, compared with the, the use of the LNG. It's necessary to analyze the, res the, the receiving store and transfer uh, systems to the ammonia to the engines, the control of the operation, detection system, bend, poor, inner fault lines, and uh, the structures to house uh, the equipment. If you look, this is uh, taken from uh, the MCC circular that suggests the people that need to involve in, uh, in the HACIF uh, studies. As you can see here, no, nobody has taken into account the ports. In despite of the fact that I, I'm going to repeat that the bankering operation is one of the most risky operations that takes place in the activity of the vessel. We are participating in a working group that has been um, set up by, by Itochu. Itochu is a, a, a Japanese company. That uh, which is dealing with uh, some uh, gaps that uh, are in the in the regulation in this moment, and more 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 of these gaps are related to the gas detection system, uh, where installed this gas detection system, where activated automatically the the water spray system. If the water spray system is always the best option for for dealing with a liquid. Also, uh, we are uh, has been discussing about the capacity of, for, of the drain tank, which is the capacity because nobody in this moment specifies this capacity. Also, what uh, are the requirements for for uh, treating the the mix between the water and the ammonia? If it will be related to the water or not in the pore or uh, issues related to, to handling and how to handling the vent the, the ben gas, uh, if where uh, this chairs will be permitted or not. The most important issue related to the port operation, which is the safety zone, how to determine the safety zone, and several issues about the, the, the bunker in the station. It will be open, closed, or unenclosed. There are several findings that, as you can see, are also very generic. This is uh, to strengthen the position that is necessary to develop a specific regulation with more precise measures um, for building or adapting uh, vessels to be refueled with ammonia or uh, bunkering vessels. Related to the, to the use of the ammonia, for uh, the consideration that I mentioned before, uh, allowing vents during the bankering operation uh, in the port can cause significant uh, problems with the estibidores and the population. So, as much as possible, as much as possible, should be avoided. Uh, if just in case it's not possible to react the zero relays of ammonia, uh, the mass vent, we suggest the mass vent uh, must be treated as a gas leak, activating water spray system or any other system uh, for uh, minimizing the effect of the liquid. Related also to how to estimate the safety zone, this is an important issue, and, and there are several, a lot of uncertainties. The safety zone is uh, very important because uh, as much as possible, we try to uh, coordinate or, or, or conduct CMOP operations uh, at the same time. Why? Because we are reducing the time that the, bird is, uh, is, uh, that, that the vessel is at the bird, and we are not increasing uh, the cost of the bankering operation, moving the vessel to, to other key for conducting the bankering. It's necessary to block an area uh, of the vessel for avoiding a container files into the bunkering bars and provoke a release. But at any time, we suggest that when 
um, there are a relax, a minimum relays, an audible uh, warning will be emitted in order to, to prevent stevedores and the, and the crew uh, of the situation. We need to enter in a, a, or, or to discuss more in depth an important issue is how we establish the limit on the safety zone because there are a plethora of um, limits that we can establish and the, the, the difference between them is important. If we use the, the guidelines provided by the IPA, as you can see, the level one um, is the level in which we can provoke a minimum effect of the person exposed is a reversible effect. In the second level, uh, will be more serious with a long-term effect on the health of the people. And in the third one, could lead to, the, could lead to a permanent uh, disease and also to the death or the people exposed to the, to the leakage. If now we enter in the values provided by the occupational uh, agencies, uh, you can see that the, the European uh, indicative occupational exposure limit provides a limit of 20 uh, ppms during each air and in the short term, 50 minutes, 50 ppms. It will look at what um, the American Conference uh, of uh, Industrial Hygienists is providing for uh, the, mm, the period of uh, the long term, the each hours period during, well, the normal, the normal operation, eight hours per day, uh, 20 hours per week, is providing a limit of 25 ppms while for the uh, for the short times a 50 minutes of relays the limit is established in 35 uh, ppms this is very important because this in, is this effect to the size of the safety zone that we need to keep at the minimum as possible if not we are interfering so much in the actual port operations and any operation that we are introducing in the port should not disturb uh, so much. Well, entering more in the, in the issues related to the safety zone, it's necessary to consider also the lessons learned uh, from the implementation of the LNG. At the beginning of the implementation, we have considered a relays that led to a safety zone so big. When we enter in what is a reasonable for a stable world leakage scenario, the safety zone has been considerable reduced. Then we need to enter also on this. What is the scenario which is realistic for um, determining the safety zone? It's necessary also to understand what is the behavior of the, of the ammonia, which is very different to the, to the LNG. And uh, unfortunately, the only way to reduce the safety zone is investing in safety measures on board both the fuel vessel and the bunker in vessel. Also, we need to discuss about the issues like uh, bunker in a station open, enclosed, semi-enclosed, depending on the time of the vessel, um, some configurations present advantages or disadvantages, but this is something, it's an issue that needs to be uh, analyzed in depth. But also for the ports, it's necessary to consider that in case of accident, there are other activities that are taking in the port, a plethora of activities with a high diversity of activities, and an accident is necessary to analyze how this accident will interfere in these activities and how it will pose additional risks. And this is all from my side. Thank for your attention. If you have any question, please do not hesitate to contact with uh, Fernando Jimeno or myself.
Thank you very much, Mercedes, for this exhaustive presentation on the opportunities and challenges that are linked to ammonia from a port perspective. I'm sure uh, we are just at the beginning of the game for this, and that is clearly a need to look uh, into these issues, not only from the perspective of the ship, but also from the perspective of a port. And we know very well also what is a port in a city very often. So a, a, a huge level of challenges to handle, for sure. We are for the last presentation of another real case. Actually, it's very close to us, it's in Portugal. And we have uh, the representative from uh, Priu that will uh, uh, present what's going on now in Portugal. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, all. I am going to be brief. As I understand, I am between uh, you and the lunch. So uh, my name is Luis Nunes. I am, I am a board member of Priu, a Portuguese entity. Uh, and uh, later on, I am going to be, do a, a brief presentation of the company. Uh, thank you, EMSA, for, for the invitation. Thank you for the cabinet to the, the Portuguese Secretary of State for Maritime Affairs. That was possible to be here. Um, all participants, uh, face to face here and um, online, understanding that from all different places of Europe. Um, first, okay. um, Prio. Uh, Prio was born for the energy transition 16 years ago, more or less. Um, and basically, since the beginning, the um, finding solutions for uh, emission reductions was the main main key. The first asset was on the on the biodiesel uh, biodiesel production. Uh, we are following three main drivers. Um, first, uh, we try to look for solutions, not problems. Uh, usually, in the liquid liquid industry. Uh, we are always claiming uh, the issues with the uh, um, lack of uh, feedstocks whatsoever. Uh, we try to focus on the on the solutions. Also, we think that we need to 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 take actions for today, not for tomorrow or in ten years or in twenty uh, only. Basically, we need to find solutions for uh, our clients, for our society to meet the goals uh, um, starting from now. And the last one, uh, regulations, mandates should be the minimum uh, targets. So we may be able to do more. Prio, uh, as, as I said, in this chart is just a quick presentation. We are in different sectors, uh, mostly in Portugal. Uh, we have a, a a biodiesel plant and the tanks blending tank farm in the Aveiro, that is in the north side of Portugal. Um, however, we um, we are one of the main electrical mobility players in Portugal. We have the, the traditional propane and the other uh, uh, solutions for our clients. On the biodiesel uh, sector, um, we were on the first uh, producers to use feedstocks, uh, waste feedstocks started with, with the used cooking oil um, and these days uh, we are using other advanced wastes like uh, food wastes, uh, SBOs and others. Um, based on the, the, the full supply chain and the different uh, channels, we uh, not only are producing these products but also deliver to the final clients. On the, on the road fuels, and uh, since uh, 2020 on the maritime, maritime um, sector. So this is our current solutions, zero diesel uh, for uh, um, road, road fuels uh, with 100% biodiesel already in place. Eco diesel is, uh, is um, a, retail, a retail solution with 15% with, uh, of biodiesel, then solutions with very high content of ethanol, um, 
be uh, uh, another solution of diesel with uh, higher than the traditional 15% uh, of biodiesel, B, B30, electrical green, G, uh, LPG, and eco bunkers, the one that I would like to, to take the detention from, from, from now on. So basically, um, two years ago, uh, we based it on our experience on the, on the road fuels, we um, we saw that on the maritime sector uh, the discussion is much about the the the, the new technologies, uh, new solutions, and we find that we may able to provide uh, um, a solution as of now. Um, we are delivering the, the this product that we call it Eco Bankers that pretty much is a, is a fifteen percent. Um, biodiesel uh, of waste based feedstocks with the marine gas oil blend um, in different ports in Portugal uh, with different different clients is um, there is no additional investment uh, as was mentioned also in the, uh, before in other presentations this is a, an example of a drop-in without um, any any major requirement um, there is uh, when we we see it 18% emission reduction uh, maybe not seems too much, but this is a start, uh, is a beginning, uh, and this is a solution that it can be implemented uh, and is being implemented today. Actually, uh, based on the external external um, research, you find it that actually it can it can leave it can go up to 10% in, uh, reduction on consumptions. Of course. On the economical point of view, it helps uh, uh, for our our client. So the idea is to have uh, immediate impact uh, um, without without major uh, or important uh, investments. This is the the, the cycle. Uh, most of you, for sure, uh, uh, has a good idea uh, uh, or already knows what it is. Basically, we start with the, with the resin materials that we transport for our plants. We do the process and deliver to the clients. Here, what I would like to mention is on the, on the, um, on the presentation, this uh, blue uh, box. Uh, basically, we have it in our uh, all filling stations and um, uh, the idea is to collect the feedstock. So the feedstocks, uh, I, we cannot, uh, we, we really need to, to figure out what it is, but is, is, it can be an issue. Um, and the problem, uh, one of the, the, the issues that the people are raising is, okay, you are uh, sourcing the feedstocks in the other, in the other uh, side of the world, how it comes with the real emissions and so on. So our approach is that we go up to the, the collecting point. Um, of course, this is for, for uh, uh, in this case, uh, is for end families. However, we are working with uh, different companies uh, to source on the um, restaurants and other collecting points for, for um, use cooking oil in this case. So, um, to be brief, I, I have here a, a, a quick video that is showing what we are doing since the beginning. So it shows the collecting side of our wastes, uh, how, you, how we produce it, and uh, one example of one of our clients that is uh, in this case in particular is the Aveiro port um, that are, are running basically the pilot, pilot um, boats with this product for since more than one year and a half. Um, we are finding very interesting um, outcomes. So is a kind of an example uh, that without uh, without uh, major investment or at all any investment, we can do it uh, now. Uh, one last thing is that uh, the our products are coming from, uh, as I said, waste uh, uh, feedstocks for producing biodiesel. Um, so zero veg oils as of today. So,
So um, just the uh, as as was discussed, the idea is to find um, find the easy solutions for for act today, um, and this is just an example what 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 can be done. Um, thank you for 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 your time. Thank you for, for sharing an experience focused on biofuels. And now we have been sharing a lot of information. Of course, it's just, as I said, the first piece of the puzzle. And here we are looking more at the perspective of the production, of the availability, the sustainability, the scalability. Uh, we had the well to wake perspective uh, uh, and then of course we have also the regulators uh, who provided an overview of the direction where everything is going and uh, we know that only a basket of measure will be the the possible recipe with involvement of all the segments of the of uh, the chain uh, the maritime value chain as it was referred by rule, uh, will play a, an important role as well. So I open the floor to questions to our first round of contributors, comments. I start from the room for the ones that uh, took the time uh, to come also to, to, to Lisbon. Is there anybody who would like to share something or comment what uh, has been said until now react the room is croatia please croatia the floor is yours uh, hello my name is thomas abudic uh, i have a, a question for mr carlo batista uh, you mentioned during the your presentation that uh, all ports um, on all, all core ports uh, on the 10T network should have uh, uh, LNG infrastructure till 2030. Okay, is that means that uh, it's uh, from uh, economical and uh, uh, point of view that uh, LNG is acceptable not only as a transitional fuel, uh, but only uh, and after 2030. Thanks. Thank you. In, indeed, uh, the alternative fuel infrastructure regulation is a particular legislative development that does not take place in, in vacuum or in, in, in an empty uh, document because the alternative fuel infrastructure directive already exists with specific targets for LNG. So the challenge for the AFIR as a legislative exercise was we cannot scrap what member states already have today as targets and they do have targets for LNG uh, bunkering development. And therefore, there was a need to have this uh, incorporation of these targets into the AFIR, and therefore the LNG bunkering uh, infrastructure targets remain. But we enhance, uh, the, let's say, the ambition for the shore power developments, because the shore power is really the epicenter of the maritime angle of the AFIR development. You touch an important uh, concept, which is the transition fuel. LNG has been mentioned as transition fuel in different debates or in some fora. It's criticized for its potential greenhouse gas uh, um, impacts uh, due to methane emissions, either of an operational nature or of, of uh, associated to methane slip. Um, and uh, of course, not going into that debate, who who decides what the transitional fuel is, is a mix of factors. Look at today, ships are operating on dual fuel engines are operating exclusively on, on diesel because LNG is so expensive. Um, how, how a fuel, any fuel, biodiesel, biodiesel of different feedstock or different production pathway, how, how this fuel will be eligible for a transition fuel is remarkably affected not only by technical considerations, but also by economical, geopolitical, as you can see today. So I'm not in a position to really say that uh, there is a silver bullet for the transition. It's going to be, for sure, if we just look at uh, the energy options we have today, 
a big big effort for the industry to 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 step up and develop uh, a, a good level of alternatives lng if used with the right energy conversion if used with the latest generation of uh, uh, of dual fuel engines is in my personal opinion an important uh, an important solution to have in mind for the for the next use for sure thank you as usual, uh, there is always a short-term, a medium-term, and a long-term uh, perspective to take into consideration. And all uh, the, 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 the things we have been discussing, also in terms of uh, availability, scalability, will come, of course, uh, into picture to, to identify also what is going to be. And not one solution fits all that we know already. So it's, it's, it's clearly going to be a transition that will be driven uh, by a lot of different uh, pulsions. Um, I focus still one moment in the room to see if there is uh, anybody who would like to share anything at this stage on this first uh, part. If it's not the case, I move to the chat that I know was uh, quite lively <laughs> during uh, the, the presentations. There were uh, a lot of, of, of comments uh, and, uh, of course, uh, um, questions that were popping up whilst uh, we were uh, uh, sharing uh, information. So can we start with the, with the chat, Sergio? Yes, <clears throat> certainly we can start with the chat. There were there were uh, various questions that were posed uh, in the chat. Uh, one that uh, captured our attention was related to the initial targets that will be will need to be reached uh, in 2030 with the EU and the six percent uh, reduction uh, target in greenhouse gas intensity. And uh, there was a question on whether there should be uh, sufficient uh, biomass availability to meet uh, this target. Uh, we had uh, several presentations. We had Shell, we had Prior. Uh, so maybe we can try to set some light also with uh, our own study. Uh, uh, maybe we can try to, to discuss about this possibility of the biomass availability uh, for meeting this first uh, target in 2030. So biomass availability taking into consideration the competition between sectors, okay? Because uh, that is also the big question that in terms of energy strategy, uh, uh, decision makers, regulators and the industry will need to take into consideration. So it's uh, not only an absolute value, but also in perspective, because we know there is competition on that. See that, we start. Thank you, uh, Manuela. And <laughs> it, this, this is a little bit an awkward question because there is no answer to it. Um, it, it is something that we'll have to that, that we have to find out. Um, as, as, as I showed in my presentation and uh, as we also included in our study, um, if you just look at the demand from the maritime sector, there is no issue with regards to availability. And that is true at the global scale. It's also true at the European scale. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the point is, and, and I think Prio made it also clear in, in the presentation, that um, biomass is used in, in, a, in many transport sectors and then also outside of, uh, of transport sectors. And... Um, Ultimately, this this is there there is a market. There is a competition in the market for uh, biomass, and um, when the biomass is transformed into biofuel, there is a competition in the market for for biofuel. And um, as in any market, uh, the one who is willing to pay the most uh, will get it. Um, and that, of course, depends on what the alternatives are and and what the regulation requires. Um, I, I think the, um, we, we haven't included it in this study, but, but uh, we've looked at it um, in other studies, uh, whether um, the, the targets for 2025 and 2030 of Furio Maritime um, are difficult to achieve. Um, and in our view, they're, they're not difficult to achieve and actually easier to achieve than the, than the Commission um, had in their... Um, 
uh, in their overall impact assessment. Um, mainly because um, one thing that the impact assessment uh, did not take into account, and they, they modeled demand from all the sectors, and there this competition was more or less present in the, in the modeling. The, the total biomass availability was constrained, but um, uh, there were two aspects that were not um, uh, included in the model. First of all was the uh, projected increase in, um, in LNG fueled ships. Um, and, and we saw even um, uh, in, in August about uh, this year, half of the order book for new ships is um, uh, LNG or LNG ready ships. Uh, so the, the, uh, the, the number of LNG ships will continue or the share of LNG ships will continue to grow in the, in the coming decades. It, of course, it depends on what the prices will do. But um, since LNG has lower emissions, it will help meeting the, the overall targets of fuel EU maritime, and that decreases the pressure, uh, the demand for uh, biofuels from um, uh, uh, from fuel EU maritime. And a second reason why we think um, it, it may actually be easier to achieve than, than uh, in the uh, in the modeling for the for the overall impact assessment, is that um, the shipping sector can and does source biomass imports outside Europe, uh, and this has also not been taken into account in the um, uh, in the modeling. Uh, but we know that um, uh, that that ports in Asia are providing. Um, uh, uh, bio blends to uh, to the shipping industry and these can be used to comply uh, with fuel EU maritime if these ships sail uh, to European ports. So for those two reasons um, we we don't think that the availability of, uh, of biofuels even when uh, taking competition about, about around um, uh, biomass into account will hinder meeting the objectives of fuel you maritime. Thank you very much. Fuel you maritime. Then it's quite natural that I turn to the European Commission. Ricardo. Thank you. Thank you. And to, to thank also Jasper's uh, point. In fact, in the impact assessment uh, and in the study supporting the impact assessment uh, for the fuel EU, um, there was confirmed availability of uh, biomass for biofuels for shipping. There's a number of possible considerations, especially for with higher uncertainty for later uh, targets and on the fuel mix uh, to, to meet uh, later targets. Um, and in fact, it's, it's uh, something that uh, even with the competition across sectors, the availability of biomass uh, for um, uh, fuel EU is um, estimated to be to be to be there, and I make the note that uh, the fuel EU includes a restriction to consideration of food and feed crop uh, biofuels, and this was uh, just confirmed with the two co-legislators also assuming this position to ensure that. Uh, streams from uh, food and feed crop uh, uh, biofuels uh, production pathways would not be considered or would not be granting any greenhouse gas benefit in the calculation of the greenhouse gas intensity of the energy use. So food and feed crop first generation biofuels treated as otherwise bio, uh, fossil fuels uh, for the greenhouse gas uh, calculations. Thank you. As, uh, as, as Rul said, we are looking really at the real uh, climate impact. Uh, so in, in perspective, that's what is uh, relevant. Uh, can I turn to, to Shell and Prio? Would you like to add anything from your perspective? I start from Shell. I think, sorry. Um, I think in terms of the... Uh, likely availability again it's um, the number of different feedstocks that are available are potentially overall uh, not necessarily up to 2030 but beyond that um, constraining them within fuel EU um, and not having them specifically aligned with with the red um, allowable fuels um, potentially could ultimately reduce reduce the availability of bio into into shipping um, but I think up to 2030 with the pooling 
and things like that, then um, and the onshore power as well requirement, it's likely that meeting that target will be relatively straightforward, especially with the, the LNG vessels and um, bio LNG going into to vessels as well. Thank you, Prio. Yes, we, we think that um, is, of course, in 10, 20 years, uh, it may be different. Um, for today, um, the availability of the feedstocks, waste feedstocks, um, is, may not be a, a major issue. Of course, uh, for instance, uh, 10 years ago, availability of UCUS uh, was also the, the main question. And from now on, uh, apparently, the, the, the industry has been find ways to collect more. Uh, and um, and in the other wastes is happening the same the same the same way. Uh, so a full industry of um, of collecting different wastes is 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 uh, is happening now. Uh, different companies. You are see that uh, a few years ago, uh, very very family small companies were were uh, were um, collecting the different wastes. Now are they are growing. There are important companies in different places. Of Europe and the old wild, so I think uh, um, is the is a good point the the availability of the feedstocks for uh, different uh, potential um, ways, and if uh, maritime sector is going to be able uh, to compete with other alternative uses, um, we think that in the short term is not is not a major issue. Thank you very much. I mean, it, it comes also very clearly out of from our study that the, the biofuels are, let's say, a, a low-hanging fruit in this moment. So there is a lot of potential uh, for the sector there. Sergio, let's continue with the chat. Yeah, I think there were several comments related to the use of uh, ammonia that uh, perhaps we can group uh, into one uh, a single a set of questions that we can address now. Uh, one, uh, for instance, was related uh, to the possible need of pilot fuel uh, when we use uh, ammonia, and what will be the impact uh, for greenhouse gases that perhaps uh, ABS can uh, help us address in, because we have uh, this contemplated in our study. Uh, but there were uh, many comments uh, related to the safety track of uh, ammonia in the industry, in land-based uh, applications, and uh, whether I think the question was more linked to whether we can extrapolate uh, a forecast of uh, incidents uh, happening in, during bunkering operations, for example, uh, based on the history of uh, incidents uh, in land-based uh, applications. And uh, in connection to that, uh, whether we need uh, additional safety measures uh, when, for example, we will uh, have a new uh, bunkering installations, uh, whether there will be a need for additional safety measures compared, for example, to the use of uh, LNG as uh, bunkering in the ports, uh, whether we can uh, be at the same uh, safety level or we need uh, additional uh, safety limitations. So maybe we can start with the uh, part on the pilot fuel, and then we can go into the safety track of, uh, of the industry for ammonia. Okay, so uh, ammonia clearly it's uh, it's it's very much in the focus. Uh, also, the the level let's say of, of maturity is 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 uh, different, but the, there is also potential there. But the safety let's say framework is uh, of a total different nature. So let's start from uh, ABS then. Safety we will focus also tomorrow very much. But I think already with the, the presentation by Mercedes, there is already clearly focus on, on that so we can't really compartmentalize the discussion so ibs please yeah i will I'll come to the come to it uh, later in in the presentation today uh we're going to talk about suitability of, of the biofuels and also ammonia but it's clear that uh, ammonia does not burn by itself uh, it, it needs a ignition source uh, the question is how much uh, pile fuel do you need to, to ignite it uh, this is not clear yet. Uh, the expectation is that in best case uh, can come down to, to 5% and uh, I guess uh, MAN can, can uh, confirm that. Um, 
But it also will also depends on what type of uh, combustion principle which is selected for for burning of uh, of ammonia, whether it's going to be in a auto type. Uh, auto cycle type of engine or a diesel cycle type of engine, uh, they may also impact the amount of uh, biofuel. But in, in those engines uh, we see being developed today, then uh, biodiesel can be used to ignite it. Uh, and there could also be uh, other ways to, to ignite uh, uh, ammonia in the future. We see uh, also DME uh, could be a, a good igniter that could be developed for, for those type of engines. Uh, so I think it's it's uh, it is uh, an issue that needs to be considered, but I think also there's a solution to be, that, that can be found to it. Thank you. Anybody else who would like to intervene on uh, ammonia? Uh, also from uh, from the chat, if there is anybody who wants to take the floor and not only using uh, the chat. Uh, Teams can support also interventions, uh, vocal interventions uh, in this context. Do I have uh, anybody else that would like to take the floor in relation to ammonia? Before the chat was quite lively, so maybe somebody wants to to intervene on this and, and express uh, comments. I give a second to see if anybody raises the hand so that we can. Uh, give the floor is there anybody that raises the hand no so they were no please yeah. i can uh, also give it uh, a try here on this uh, question uh, we are going tomorrow to look at uh, uh, hazard risk assessment for for different ship types and here we will come into to this question but but uh, it's clear that uh, I think the missing uh, point is to evaluate uh, bunkering and, and the safety issues around uh, bunkering. Uh, in different projects where we are starting the use of uh, ammonia, uh, we are looking at uh, solutions on how to how to limit the cloud if, in case you have a rupture of a, of a pipe. Um, so I think uh, my vision for, for this is that it will, we will start with the bunkering outside ports, but uh, then we'll develop in, in combination with, with this also procedures for, for limiting the cloud in case of uh, failures. And then, uh, as we have seen for LNG, that uh, also bunkering will move in, into port at, at a later stage. Thank you very much. Um, is there anything else from the chat at this stage? There is one more question. Yes, please, Sergio. There is one final question, perhaps going up slightly beyond uh, the purpose of this uh, workshop, but uh, given that uh, the question was addressed in Shell and we have the presence of uh, the European Commission, maybe we can try to, to have some final discussion on this one. And is, it concerns uh, the need to provide uh, uh, renewable fuels from non-biological origin and whether there should be a quota in uh, fuel EU. Uh, to address this uh, for uh, maritime uh, transport, whether there should be a quota for uh, this kind of fields in the field EU, given that the RED uh, already provides that there is a need to, to supply uh, these fields. And it was part of the presentation from Cell. And, uh, so, basket of fuels, uh, technology uh, neutral, but, but, <laughs> so Ricardo. Thank you. I was... Actually, looking at the, the agenda, I was thinking I was going to get to lunch without having to deal with the RFNBOs, but uh, <laughs> but apparently not. So, uh, and the reason is simple because uh, RFNBO uh, sub-target and uh, including a specific mandate for this uh, renewable synthetic fuels is the very reason that the vote of the fuel EU in in Parliament uh, was delayed from July to to October, and uh, now Parliament is. Uh, included uh, not only a multiplier to reward the operators that use uh, green synthetic fuels, but also a sub-target to, to include mandates for, for these fuels so that operators from 2030, in the current version of, of the proposal, uh, operators from 2030 would have to blend in or some sort of green synthetic fuel um, into the energy uh, used on board ships. In, in and the Commission uh, proposal has been a essentially a technology neutral one, hasn't included 
any sort of specific prescriptive mandates for fuels uh, of any type. Uh, the only uh, exception to this technology neutrality was the safeguard included around food and feed crop biofuels. Apart from that, there was no technology-specific prescription in the fuel EU. This is a clear deviation. Irrespective of the merit that green, fuel, green synthetic fuels may have for decarbonization. In the Commission uh, opinion, and of course the co-legislation process is ongoing, but um, we will, with a mandate of 2%, even of 1%, even of 0.5%, it is irrespective of the magnitude, we will um, introduce a constraint to operators who in 2030 will have, in the vast majority, a fleet uh, dominated by traditional diesel-based installations, which will be left with a blend-in option, essentially, of uh, e-diesel. And the production of e-diesel and the availability of e-diesel for uh, blending in uh, into these type of uh, magnitude uh, for availability is questionable. A 2% mandate would mean uh, around um, 10 gigawatts of uh, renewable installed electricity, uh, which is roughly twice what Denmark has uh, installed today in terms of wind power. So the magnitude of the 2% uh, needs to be put in this scale and needs to be expressed in this scale. And it is certainly a political challenge for implementation. From a practical perspective, it represents uh, also a very significant challenge. Uh, but of course, I mean, uh, as I also learned in the agency, impossible is something that we don't say. So, and since we are in a co-legislation process, we need to respect the, the position of the co-legislators. And uh, we can uh, certainly only be looking forward for the trilogues uh, phase that we will be starting very soon. And uh, this will be a very interesting point of discussion. Thank you. Of course, there are always uh, different dimensions. We know all very well uh, since we've been involved uh, in uh, the making of legislation at IMOTU level long enough uh, to know that there is a political dimension and there is a technical dimension. And uh, uh, hopefully they coincide, but not always they coincide. So uh, we will look forward to see what is going to be the legislative framework at the end of this uh, co-legislative uh, procedure. But of course, all of us know that the ambitious objectives demand serious efforts from all the, the parties involved. I have Santiago from EMSA. Santiago. Thank you. Thank you, Manuela. Um, I, have, I have a question here for Mercedes from the Valencia port because I found the presentation really very interesting. Um, it's more, it's, it's like a crystal ball question, so it's not easy. So we have heard today about many different types of alternative fuels, about ammonia, hydrogen, biofuels, even LNG, and what I call alcohol-based fuels. This would mean that in the future, ports would have to deal with five different logistic chains, five different ways to storage the, the fuel, five different banking procedures, five different types of risks. So my question is, how can ports prepare for such uh, a mix you know, of different fuels? Or would you see the future in a way that there will be one or two winners out of all these, let's say, mix of fuels? Mercedes, your crystal ball, then. <laughs> <laughs> yes, not, well, let me to say that uh, actually um, ports can use a high number of operations. For instance, for ammonia, it's quite, use, quite, quite, quite normal um, to unload vessels with ammonia for being used it, uh, in fertilizers or something like this, but it's as an operation that uh, takes place regularly in a concentrated part of the pool under control 
and so on, and not widely in the poor and several times per day, which increases the risk. Uh, how we are to manage step by step? The important is providing safety measures or safety regulations uh, for every different uh, operation and considering uh, the, the key is the safety distance. The key is the, the safety zone. We need to calculate the safety zone in appropriate way for avoiding other operations uh, uh, when, when the bunkering is taking place. This is the main constraint, but we not can overlook safety, so much safety measures that any activity takes place in the pool, because it's not the, the, the main, uh, the main uh, use of the pool. Uh, the pool is, has an impact in the economy, a, a long impact in the local and national economies, and uh, need to be uh, at in a fluent way. Then. But uh, how we will this uh, conducting hazards for any uh, potential uh, bunkering operation and for any potential uh, fueling uh, installation? But uh, they, uh, related to the Port of Valencia, we have terminals for uh, ethanol, methanol, uh, fossil fuels, etc., etc., LNG, ammonia. This is something that we are using to manage. The difference, the main difference is that uh, this is located, controlled, and not widely happen in all the poor. Thank you, Mercedes, for, uh, for uh, this uh, clarification uh, that it's, uh, I think it's uh, quite important. If uh, we don't have any more uh, questions or comments at this stage we break for lunch and we reconvene at uh, quarter past 2 14 15 lisbon time with uh, another uh, presentation that will kick off another round of uh, discussions i'm sure see you at uh, 2 15 thank you You have a lunch in the atrium of the conference center available.
So good afternoon to all. Please take your seat. And we start again. Zoom is started, Sharif. Okay. And we start again with a second block with focus on our fuels, the ones that we have analyzed. We are going now to look to suitability, regulatory gaps, another very important uh, aspect. It's not only an issue of uh, production and availability, but it's also an issue, an issue of what is uh, suitable and uh, how it is uh, regulated. As it was said already this morning, both from uh, IMO and the European Commission, there is clearly a role for the regulators here to give uh, predictability and the certainty. Work is ongoing at different levels and uh, the study is now showing again what is the state of play, both for biofuels and uh, ammonia. We have our contractor, uh, this time is ABS, that uh, will introduce us uh, on this um, overview. And uh, we start with uh, René Lorsen. René, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for, for this introduction and uh, thank you to, to IMSA for organizing this. And thanks a lot for this uh, great uh, dinner we just had. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot. I will um, have shared, uh, we are sharing this uh, presentation between uh, Danielle and, and me, and I will go through the first part, which is about uh, sustainability. Uh, we have uh, ranked the different uh, fuels, uh, biofuels that we have been looking at and, and focused on, on those we've, we found to be most attractive here in, in our study. And uh, we came out with a result that uh, FAME and uh, HVO uh, and also methane and uh, methanol in, in a bioform is those who's uh, most attractive. Uh, right below also DME came in as, a, as an alternative. So in the, in the hazard that we are going to discuss uh, tomorrow, where we are looking at the risk assessment, we are going to focus on, on these uh, type of fuel. Uh, though that uh, biomethane and also biomethanol uh, uh, these are chemical identical to what you see uh, being used today, uh, so there's no, there was no need for doing any further risk uh, assessment uh, about these type of fuels. So the focus has been FAME, HVO and, and DME in, in, the, in the risk assessment. If you look at uh, those who uh, looks like uh, diesel, most uh, FAME and HVO, uh, you can see there that the uh, cetane number is, is uh, higher than it is for marine gas oil uh, for both of them, meaning that they can be used as a, as a fuel uh, without any uh, ignition source, so they can use directly in the combustion uh, chamber. The cetane number is the fuel's ability to, to self-ignite, uh, said in a, in, a, in a smart form. Um, the calorific value for those uh, fuels, FAME and HVO is, is slightly uh, smaller than, uh, than it is for, for normal fuel oil. Um, if the, it is on the borderline, then uh, at uh, 30, uh, 40, uh, 34 uh, megajoule per, per kilogram, uh, there might be some, some change to, to some uh, Indian types. But it is uh, in the range where it, it can be used uh, on, in Indians. Uh, if you look at the oxygen content uh, in fame, uh, this is the reason for the higher uh, NOx that is expected for using those in, in Indian. Uh, we see that uh, those tests that has been done with the uh, fame fuel, uh, their uh, NOx is increasing uh, in the areas of, of 10%, sometimes a little higher and sometimes a, a little lower. So this is the expectation there. Um, but it is more or less uh, similar to what we see on, on uh, the he heavy fuel oil in, in some cases when this is being used in, in Indian and low sulfur fuel oil, of course. If we go to uh, DME, uh, DME is, uh, is an interesting uh, fuel because it has uh, also a high 
seating number of uh, 60, so it can be uh, it can be used to to ignite other types of fuel. Uh, the interesting part is also that uh, it can be mixed and blended in uh, basically all types of fuel. Uh, so it can be used as a fuel improver uh, also uh, in the future. But uh, if, you, if you look at uh, uh, the chemical co composition and also uh, the properties, then they are very similar to, to LPG. Uh, LPG has, however, a low CT number. It's, it's depending on uh, the use of uh, pilot fuel for, for burning this. Using those, uh, and I will go to ammonia, and using uh, ammonia in, uh, in combustion uh, engines, uh, there's, uh, as mentioned earlier, there's uh, two, two ways to, to burn this. It can be burned in an auto cycle engine or in, in a diesel cycle engine. Um, and we have given our view on uh, how uh, uh, the figures is going to be for, for these two types of engine. Uh, the figures is, is based on uh, from discussion with, with engine makers uh, of, of different uh, types. Um, what characterizes an auto cycle engine is that you send in uh, the fuel into the scavenging air and mix it with air prior to, to ignition when uh, the piston reaches the, the top dead center. Uh, position. So you have a, a mixture of uh, fuel and air before you have uh, the actual ignition done by, by a pile fuel. It can also be a spark or, or maybe a heating coil of some kind. Diesel cycle uh, works the way that uh, you have a, a pressurized uh, fuel which you inject, inject when you have the piston in, in top dead center position uh, and thereby by the injection pressure and speed you secure that you have uh, enough fuel being delivered to this combustion. And the advantage there is that you burn the fuel without any fuel slip. And this is also what uh, is expected here uh, in this study. And fuel slip for ammonia is interesting because uh, you don't want to have uh, uh, ammonia slip in the exhaust. It is uh, toxic. And there is uh, going to be regulation about how much uh, these levels is going to be. Uh, maybe uh, Daniel will touch on, on this later. Fuel efficiency um, for burning those type of fuel. Um, the expectation from uh, MAN is that uh, ammonia can can be burned with a similar uh, efficiency as uh, on a fuel oil uh, in the diesel cycle engine. Uh, maybe with a small uh, uh, penalty of uh, two to three percent, maybe four percent. It has to be seen af after testing. Uh, the auto cycle engine. Uh, the benefit of using the auto cycle to burn this fuel is that uh, you you don't have any uh, knocking when burning ammonia in a, in a auto cycle engine using ammonia. So you might be able to, to increase the MVB pressure for the future and thereby increase the efficiency. We might see that auto cycle engine will, will come out with a higher efficiency uh, once it's, it's been tested. NOx emission expectation there for auto cycle engine is that it's going to be, going to be the optimized to, to reach the tier two level. Uh, it is expected that the NOx level will, will uh, increase uh, there for, for burning uh, ammonia compared to burning uh, natural gas. If we look at the diesel cycle engine and NOx emission, uh, then we have seen uh, indication that uh, NOx may uh, drop uh, compared to, to using fuel oil, but not to the level where it, uh, it reaches uh, tier 3. So there is still a need uh, an abatement system for meeting tier 3 in, in the form of a SCR uh, system. N2O is uh, something which has been discussed a lot. It's a greenhouse gas and it's a, a result of uh, burning uh, fuel at, at low temperature in, in the combustion engine. Uh, here it is expected that the N2O is, is going to be higher for uh, auto cycle engine compared to, to diesel cycle engine. We've also looked at the uh, fuel supply system and uh, how this is going to be uh, designed for, for auto cycle uh, versus uh, diesel cycle. Uh, the diesel cycle uh, 
here you need a liquid ammonia being delivered to the engine, and uh, this can be done at, at a pressure of around uh, 80 bar. And to generate this pressure, there's a need for, for both a low-pressure pump and also high-pressure pump that can bring up this uh, pressure. Uh, for the auto cycle engine, uh, the pressure uh, can be reduced to be significantly lower because it's uh, vapor which, which has been uh, sent to the, to the engine. Uh, so therefore, uh, it can be done with a low-pressure pump and then control of, of the, the temperature uh, in heat exchangers. Common for the two system is that uh, when uh, there is a failure or stop of ammonia, uh, then uh, this system is going to be equipped with a, a recovery system, ammonia recovery system, or catching system, or sorber, or burner of, of some kind. And this is being prepared by, by all uh, makers uh, who's developing these type of engine. But otherwise, it's uh, double wall piping, it's uh, ventilation there where uh, leakage has been detected in, in the wind air system by, by sensors. We have also looked at uh, and categorized uh, the different fuels in, in drop-in type of fuels and, and uh, fuel which is uh, not uh, a fully drop-in fuel. Uh, drop-in fuel is, uh, is where the, the, the fuel can be used directly in the engine with a limited modification, or it can be blended in, in a high percentages uh, in, in the fuel. And, and those we have found to be drop-in fuel is FAME, HVO, and, and fischer trop uh, diesel. And then, of course, uh, biomethanol, bioethanol, and biomethane. Uh, these are also, all the last three is chemical identical, so therefore there's no issues with blending in existing fuel. Those uh, where blending uh, in a high uh, <coughs> rate and can be problematic is uh, is uh, DME, it's uh, SVO, uh, HTL, biocrude, and, and pyrolysis oil, and civilizes uh, oil as well. Um, DME is uh, actually able to be blended up to 100%, but uh, it has a uh, a lower calorific value in than LPG, so engine has to be modified to to use uh, those type of fuel. Next uh, speaker here will will be Daniel, so he will uh, take over uh, the regulatory uh, and give you a, a view on the regulatory work we have done. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I feel that uh, the organization has been super super well done because. I've been talking after the regulators have talked, so uh, I, I don't feel that I have a lot to say here. And I feel like uh, preaching <laughs> to the priest in a way. Um, the other thing I would like to say is that we have people joining also online, and we also have a colleague, uh, which is uh, also mentioning the, the first slide here, Meg Dowling, He's joining on, she, she's joining online. So she also cooperating in this work. You also have another uh, co-author joining, joining online, which is Mark Penfold. <clears throat> Um, I'm not going to give you all the details of the study. I think this is an invitation for you to go and dig into the report. That's, that's the, 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 the idea here. Uh, this first slide is just to show what kind, type of regulations we have uh, assessed during the study. We look into international regulations and we can see the list here uh, of all those uh, kind of regulation standards that are applied internationally. And we also look into regional ones both inland and uh, shipping ones. Of, of course, we had a, a good talk from the regional regulations this morning from the Fit for 55 package. So this was assessed along with some other countries that are listed here. So if you want to know, learn more about these things, the assessment, the gap analysis, you're invited to go there and have a look in the report. Of course, uh, today's, I'm gonna make a helicopter view and pinpoint the key aspects that we have identified so far. I want to start with the ISO and the ICM standards. And why I started with that is because many times in the regulations we find references to these. So the regulations, they set uh, you know, what you need to comply with and many of the times they, they make reference to these standards. So these standards are super useful because you know, they define you know, how, you, how you perform the testing of materials. There's a standard for fuel quality and so on. So these are very, very important uh, mechanisms for the industry in the, uh, in the uptake of the, uh, these alternative fuels. 
the key points that we can highlight here is for ammonia is that uh, there, is, uh, there is a good uh, set of available standards for land-based industrial applications because ammonia has been used quite a lot uh, on land. There are some available standards for, uh, for marine environment because ammonia has been carried as a cargo. Uh, so there are some standards uh, available there. But there is a, a very strong need to develop uh, the, 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 the standards for marine fuel, ammonia as a marine fuel. So this is very important, also, also mentioning the bunkering, because there will be increased bunkering, and then you know, this will be a, a, a point to tackle. On the biofuel side, um, again, I think the, the picture is more or less the same. Um, there are many of the standards that are available for their fossil fuels, and uh, we, Hanit, just talked about the fully drop-in, not fully drop-in. For some of, the biofuel, some of the biofuels being fully drop-in, some of these standards could be readily transposed into the, uh, into the uh, biofuel equivalent. So there is a work that could be done there in terms of extending the, uh, the standards that are available for fossil fuels to the bioequivalents. There is also some uh, available standards for, for, for that are used for land-based applications that could also be extended for marine environment in a more or less uh, straightforward way. And uh, one of the points to highlight here is that uh, that is mentioned there in the top uh, light, uh, right hand side is uh, the uh, the ISO standard for fuel quality and the fuel types. Uh, you can see the table. Uh, one of the things that we highlight is the need for uh, for a higher percentage to be allowed in these standards. Uh, so this is something that uh, would be appreciated uh, by the industry. I also want to highlight before I go to the IMO uh, regulations, uh, the, the, the very important role of these uh, organizations here uh, is not to be left aside. They, they define, I mean, I'm not gonna go into all the details about these, we can, we can discuss later, but they define a lot of uh, guidelines. They define uh, fuel specifications. They define also uh, procedures for bunkering and so on. And these are super useful for the industry, also for the uptake of the, of the, of the fuels. It has been for, for some of the fuels. The main point here is that there are a lot of things that are available, of course, for fossil fuels. There are a lot of things that are available for some of the gas fuels, like, uh, like, uh, like LNG for bunkering and tools for that. And the, the idea here is that uh, we know that there is work ongoing in these uh, organizations to expand these things to other fuels. This is the type of work that is very much appreciated also to provide inputs to international organization, I mean, to, to international maritime organization as they develop the, the regulations for, 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 for alternative fuels. So um, there are some here that are applied to LNG, for instance, that could be expanded and should be expanded to ammonia, for instance, as a, as a gas fuel as well. Now, I want to go to the IMO, but before, you know, I mean, I feel a little bit, uh, you know, uh, like saying something again that was said this morning. I think it's always important to know that uh, and to acknowledge that the IMO is working very hard into deriving new regulations. Uh, if you follow the, the, the subcommittees or the committee's meetings, you can see that there are all sorts of guidelines, either in draft form, interim form, or going to become mandatory instruments in the near future. Um, so it's important to highlight that there is a lot of work going on in the IMO right now in terms of the solace uh, relating to safety. Um, we had uh, a few uh, sneak view of the, uh, what was the outcome of the subcommittee CCC uh, that was held recently. And uh, there are things going on, even for the ammonia, there are things going on there. There is a, an acknowledgement of, the, of some of the gaps that are exist in the IGF code. But the IMO has a process of working, and, uh, and this process involves correspondence group, working groups, subcommittee, and committees. And this is done this way so that we ensure that uh, nothing is left, left behind. And so this study goes in a way of uh, you know, providing those indications for, for this type of work. I just wanted to make that point to, to, to acknowledge the hard work that has been done in IMO so far, and that there is a process to get the regulations in place. In terms of ammonia, um, I mean, uh, there's no mystery here. It was already said today. The main challenge is toxicity and corrosion. Um, ammonia is not a new thing for shipping. That's also something that is important to acknowledge. Uh, there's over 20 million tons of ammonia transported per year in LPG carriers. So there is a, an available knowledge out there. There is a, the IGC covers these uh, ammonia as, as, a, as a cargo and has a specs covering for storage and corrosion. So. There is already a good starting point. Of course, there is a need for updating the IGC code because the IGC code doesn't allow that uh, toxic cargos can be used as a fuel. So that's, uh, that's one bottleneck uh, to, uh, to address. 
But then, of course, we don't have an IGF code for ammonia. We started uh, in the last CCC8 meeting to, to address uh, the issues and the challenges of uh, adapting the IGF code for, for the upcoming ammonia you know, guidelines or set of regulations. But this needs to be done. So this is one of the big uh, things that needs to be addressed in the future. In the meantime, you know, we all know about all these projects, GIP, GDPs, you know, engine developments looking to ammonia as a fuel. How is that done? You know, there is a mechanism to do that, which is the alternative design procedure that was uh, mentioned this morning before lunch. It is a procedure that works. Uh, it has been used for other fuels in the past. Uh, it's still used for some fuels currently and for ammonia. But it, of course, it increases the burden on the uh, on both the class societies, the flag states, and everybody involved, the, the, the shipyards, the engine makers, and so on and so forth. So there is something on, uh, already available for those fuels in the meantime. What we have as a date for the IGF code to be updated for the ammonia is uh, 2025 uh, as a tentative uh, deadline, or I wouldn't say a deadline, but a tentative uh, target uh, for that to happen. And um, yeah, let's, let's see how that evolves. Uh, when it comes to applying solars to biofuels, I think one important point to highlight here is that uh, here are just some snapshots of some regulations that you can find in solars. Uh, and one of the points that uh, we highlighted is that they are some of these provisions that in principle you should check for the biofuels, they are vague. They are uh, vague because uh, already in the, in the fossil fuels, the types of fossil fuels that you have over there is, is, is very wide. So there's a, a, a very high uh, wide spread of types of residual distillates and even blended fuels. So, um, so how does it work in reality when you want to apply these biofuels and, and what are the class requirements when you try to use biofuels currently? This is something I'll try to address a little, a little bit in the next slides. But in a way, this type of, uh, the way that the solar was constructed, it, it allows for some leeway for the biofuels to, to be used or to be applied. Of course, that then comes in interpretations, consultations of the flags and so on. But it's, it, there, is, uh, there is this aspect to highlight. So going to the biofuels, I mean, a little bit more in detail, I think Henné talked about fully drop in and not fully drop in. The necessity is if you are gonna go for not fully drop in, that you may need to change parts of the fuel gas supply systems. There may be facing issues with storage and piping, you know, criteria and so on. So that's where, you know, the uh, one a case by case scenario, when you try to apply solars, you look into if it is a fully drop in or not fully drop in uh, biofuel. Of course, if it's a fully drop-in, it makes life much easier uh, for everybody because you know the properties of fully drop-in are very similar to the fossil fuel equivalent. Um, so it makes life easier to apply the tax that is available for oil or fossil fuels to, to, to biofuels. But it would be really helpful for the industry to have actually that written specifically and explicitly in the regulation so that we avoid sometimes uh, some flags or regulators having different point of views about this. Um, and, uh, but it's still, you know, in terms of fully drop in, one example of things that are, needs to be demonstrated is that the onboard demonstration of suitability, that uh, the equipment is suitable for working on biofuels. That's also a requirement that comes in. Um, on the not fully drop in, then when you need to replace parts or need to check that uh, there is actually a more, I mean, there's a more thorough check for the compatibility of the, of the systems for the not fully drop in uh, fuel or biofuel, then uh, the, 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 the type of work that should be done is a little bit more extensive. Of course, then you have the considerations about the flash point of the fuels or the biofuels that are going to be used. And then there are other uh, requirements that will kick in, uh, come into place. But then the, the, the type of work is more extensive where you do more procedures, onboard fuel procedures that need to be updated. And also this leads to the ISM code. Then you need to have a more, maybe more thorough risk assessment of how, how you're going to use those fuels on board. What will be the changeover procedures that need to be updated? If they need a, they need a segregation between fuels, they cannot be mixed before being injected in the, into the engine and so on. So these are things that happen if you are not fully dropping. Uh, now going to MARPOL, which is another big uh, piece of, 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 of regulation that we have from the IMO. Focusing first on the ammonia, um, I think there were a lot of the, these aspects that were highlighted this morning already, uh, uh, and I'm repeating these here. 
uh, Hine talked about the fact that uh, you're going to have this uh, ammonia catcher or ammonia um, an absorber. Uh, you know, the name of that is uh, yet uh, to be defined. But in case you have emergency shutdown, then you absorb the ammonia, you need to, to store it. Then what to, be, what to do with that ammonia that you stored, that you absorbed uh, in case of emergency shutdown? Of course, uh, ammonia is, is toxic. You cannot just put it uh, out uh, simply like that. So this is a something, something, this is, is one piece of element that needs to be considered. Maybe it should be regulations to say that you should burn it. You know, you cannot, you can, you can store it and then burn it, but eventually you may need to discharge it or do something about it. Of course, there's the issue of spillage that come in in relation to, to the users of, of ammonia as well. We're gonna talk a little bit more tomorrow about spillage and risks uh, on the safety assessment. We have the, the, the issue of the carbon factor. Uh, ammonia is not one of the few that we find in that very famous table from the EDI. So uh, in principle, it would be a carbon-free fuel with CF factor equal to zero. Uh, however, you know, it would be nice to mention that explicitly. And we all know that uh, gray ammonia is not fully uh, sustainable. We know that uh, the numbers. Uh, of course, the, 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 the study that we did was focusing to sustainable ammonia. So, uh, but you know, it's also important to highlight that currently the scope of, 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 of the MARPOL is only tank to wake emissions. So uh, this is something that needs to be updated to avoid these use of CF equal to zero potentially, which doesn't really reflect the sustainability impact of, of ammonia or gray ammonia in a way. This leads to the N2O emissions as well that need to be regulated in a way. Uh, how this should be done, uh, maybe via the NOx technical code, improving it. The same applies for the, uh, the methane, methane, not methane slip, but uh, we think about a methane slip, but uh, ammonia slip that could appear or emissions from ammonia or uncombusted ammonia that may appear. So there may be no new regimes for testing for, yeah, or new NOx technical code for, for assessing those things. The, the ammonia slip, or if you can call it a slip, is ammonia, unburnt ammonia, and then 2 In terms of biofuels and application of Marpol, again, I think here we come to the idea of blended, not blended. It is something that we saw in the, uh, in the safety studies as well, that the properties of the fuels, they change a lot uh, depending on the, the bio, the, the feedstock that you're going to use. And of course, then the behavior of the fuel changes as well. So the aspect of if you're using a biofuel from blended to not blended is also, is also uh, to some extent relevant. Um, so this is something that we are highlighting here. There's, there's the idea of the spillage of blended versus not blended uh, biofuels. Some of the biofuels are more bi de de degrad degradable than others. If you have a non-blended, bi a blended biofuel, then you may have different uh, uh, considerations about the, the spillage that you may have. But in a way, for all biofuels, they allow to reduce the SOX emissions. Depending on the biofuel, uh, it, you might end up with more NOx or less NOx. This is uh, something to be assessed. I have a slide uh, later on to talk about the new update of uh, Regulation 18, or the UI proposed by IAX. And then we have the big challenge, which is a big challenge in relation to the carbon factor for EDI, EXI, CII. As already said, uh, the IMO is tank to wake. The benefit that you may have of using biofuels is the well, well to tank, reduce or that compensates for the tank to wake emissions. Currently, this is not something that is officially in the in the in the in the set of guidelines or in the in the in Marpol regulations. So this is also a point that needs to be addressed that could potentially uh, uh, help the uptake of the biofuels. But again, these discussions to be held among other. Uh, with the uptake of other regulations, like such, such as uh, fuel levies or on all these market-based measures that are being discussed right now, to avoid any overlap as well. <laughs> One example of uh, some recent things that are happening, uh, we had the uh, Circular 795, uh, uh, the Revision 6, which is providing quite a good uh, incentive for the usage of biofuels in the industry because we the, 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 the limit for compliance was risen from 7% to 30%, where you, you assume that the, the biofuel up to B30 is uh, compliant with the NOx, so some of the NOx requirements. And then between B30 and B100, then, you know, it's all a question if you need to change your NOx critical settings, and then, you know, and then it also makes a little bit easier. So things are happening. It's a very evolving landscape. And again, I want to highlight the LCA. The LCA will be a critical one, the sustainability criteria, and how this will impact all these, uh, these regulations that we find in MARPOL. And the new ones that will, will come, you know, the IMO is also discussing market-based measures. 
So um, how the LCA will impact those things? Uh, so this is also something that, that is ongoing, but it's important to highlight. IX. Yeah, IX. Yeah, ABS is part of IX. Uh, we are the ones that ensure that these uh, mandatory instruments are followed. But also IX has an important role to play because they face the, the technical issues in terms of when they get the regulations, try to apply those regulations. And uh, that's where uh, we, we face the, the, the limitations of the field in a way. Uh, and that's where the, IMO, the IX has been proposing a few things that are very helpful for biofuels. Uh, for instance, uh, these, uh, these uh, yeah, sorry, it's the, the alarm that I need to pick up the kids. Um, <laughs> um, uh, but the, the, the IX has offered a few of these UIs, the IMO, the most recent one I just showed an example. There are unified requirements for compatibility issues. Mm -hmm and also the case of onboard demonstration that uh, is done by IX members. And there is also some consideration that I'm putting here in the screen in, in, with respect to fully drop in or not fully drop in. Uh, the aspect that uh, the class rules are not very clear on the specifications for not fully drop in. And uh, yeah, so, um, and then the idea that uh, the safety assessment is done on a case by case scenario. But there is a lot of knowledge that is being gathered within the IX members, so they could play a role into sharing more, proposing a few modifications, you, new UIs, URs that we have identified in this study. In terms of the ammonia there, you know, the class societies are, they have published rules or guidelines. Uh, we see the names here uh, of the class societies that we identified with uh, published guidelines or rules. Uh, these class societies include ourselves, but we know about our fellow colleagues from other class societies that are working on concepts of ammonia, fuel vessels, the GAPs, approval in principles, and so on. All these class societies, including us, we are getting knowledge. We are gathering a lot of knowledge, and this knowledge could be used to support the, uh, the development or interpretation of the IGF code in terms of the items that are listed here. So IX could also play an important role here to, to support because we are in this idea of the regulations that everything is happening at the same time. So cooperation will be very important. I'm not going to expand too much on the European Union because we had a, a very good lecture this morning about it. Uh, so this is ongoing. The only thing that I would like to mention is that, of course, these type of regulations are welcome. They, they provide a solid basis for the regional and sometimes partially international uptake of, uh, of fuels, alternative fuels. But this should also expand towards a more international one. So this is a very good step towards that. I'm not going to spend on it. Uh, the one thing that I would like to highlight is that we also looked into others, as I said, other regulations, land-based regulations and shipping regulations, regional regulations or regional uh, you know, uh, requirements. So this is just a few highlights of those. For land-based, for ammonia, again, it's like, um, I'll repeat something that I said, is there is a lot of good knowledge on the usage of ammonia for land-based applications. So there are, there are countries with specific regulations about those uh, in terms of uh, safety of people, how to use a PPP and PPE material, uh, uh, equipment and so on. So there is a, a exp limits of exposure and so on. And then on the shipping side as well, you know, there's, uh, there's local regulations that, uh, that are trying to incentivize locally alternative fuels, so they, um, they're just listed here. Last slide, and that will be over. This is just, uh, you have a table in the report. It's a very comprehensive table that is uh, put in the main body of the report, but also in the appendix with a lot of details. These are, this is the summary of the gaps in the regulatory study that, that we did. We classify them in no gaps or changes needed for some of the regulations, small or minor gaps, medium gaps, and some challenging ones, and then large to many challenges that need to be addressed. So you can see uh, that for biofuels, there's the number of gaps are not that uh, high, and then they, are, they tend to be on the medium to small ones. As of uh, ammonia, the picture is different, uh, and that's where we find more a large number of gaps in the medium to high. So, of course, you can find all the details in our reports, and uh, I will invite you to go in and have a look into them. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, for this, uh, and uh, of course, uh, Lars, for this comprehensive overview. Of course, you've seen uh, that uh, we are going uh, into depth uh, now, and uh, I really uh, 
would like to invite you to read the, the report because there is a lot of information uh, gathered there. Mm, this is just a very general uh, overview. It gives already a taste of the challenges uh, that uh, we need to face uh, to give uh, this famous uh, predictability and certainty in the standards to be applied. Um, the magnitude of the challenge is different for biofuels and uh, ammonia. Uh, but since uh, most of these uh, um, approaches that are currently ongoing are technology neutrals, uh, all these things we really need to be looked at uh, and um, an answer found in uh, a relatively short uh, time horizon uh, because as we know investments uh, have to happen uh, in the next uh, years uh, if we want to have an impact uh, in 2050. So um, we continue with the uh, sharing of experience as we've done in, in, uh, in the morning and then we will move to the interaction on, on this and uh, uh, I am very happy to welcome here a representative from MAN, uh, Kild Abo, who will uh, uh, give us the perspective of an, an engine uh, manufacturer because as we said the whole chain needs to be on board. Please the floor is yours. Ah, okay. <laughs> Maybe a little bit better. Um, my name is Kilobo. I've been in the company for 39 years. Always worked with the two-stroke engine and I have worked very much with fuels, loops, emissions and gases. Uh, I have had uh, different positions in the company uh, and I have also been uh, <clears throat> chairman of the CMAC fuel oil group for 30 years, uh, also member of ISO. Uh, 217 at the same, 8217 in the same period of time. I would like to touch about the future fuel and the engine design, and of course with the attention uh, on the biofuels and ammonia. I also have to mention that I'm here instead of Dorte Kubel, who was invited. She could not come, unfortunately. We will look a little bit about who we are, what we are doing, and how we decide to make new engines uh, and uh, engines that can operate with future fuels. I'm coming from Copenhagen. It's here where MAN Energy Solution, we have our headquarter for two-stroke design and development. We have also our research center there. 15 years ago, I was in charge of our research center. I had 30 engineers uh, and one research engine. Today, we have two research engines and 65 plus engineers. The last decade really have made a lot of push for going into new technology, both when it comes to tier three, tier two, uh, and of course also all the new fuels. <clears throat> we expect, our, when we look at it, that we actually cover 50% of the global freight. That means the power used in the maritime world, 50% is ours. That means also we have quite an obligation to go in and look to this CO2 footprint that our engines are given. Starting a little bit about what uh, engines we are talking about, we have an engine program that goes from three to 83 megawatt. Here we are talking about 83 megawatt, very, very huge engine with, a, you can say, a weight on 2,400 tons. We speak about two-stroke engines, and you see all the overlap for different engine sizes. Bore sizes is the number you have there, for instance, 70, 70 centimeter bore of a cylinder. But a lot of overlap because it's important to have the optimum engine for whatever application you have. And it's, of course, both container vessels, tankers, bulkers, wall packs, and all the different uh, vessels over 2,000 dead weight ton where the two-stroke engine is, is normally used. So, starting with biofuel, we have quite a long uh, experience with biofuel, both on two- and four-stroke engines. And uh, there have been challenges, of course, or you can say tasks, 
because what we do today is we say to the operator, send us a specification and we will see if there's something which is not good when you're using the biofuel. But I have to say in my time uh, in the business, I've never heard anything about the bi bad biofuel in our engines. It has always been a success if the biofuel have been treated correctly before it enter into the engine. And that is, of course, an important part. And for that, we have, uh, uh, of course, as an engine designer, we have recommendations how to do that in the right way. So technical guidelines and so on, but biofuels covered in, in our guidelines is uh, FAME. And as mentioned, Daniel mentioned before, we actually in CMAC group made a recommendation how to do with FAME 7. Um, we have uh, blends with ISO 8217 uh, compliant with uh, uh, DM and RM grades, similar FAME type fuels. Hydro-treated vegetable HVO is also part of what we normally do. And if there's others, yeah, we have, uh, for instance, uh, but not saying about others, but that's maybe some of the extreme that we actually have engines operating now on animal fat. So um, we, from our side, we it's very little we have to say technically about our engines. You don't change anything on the engine except for if it is a very special biofuel, for instance, with acid number, which is extremely high or things like that. If you look at this one, you will see what we have already in order for our dual fuel engine and what type of fuels that we can actually burn. We started in 2011, 12, where we had the first order on methane. And uh, René, he also from ABS, also mentioned about the auto cycle and the diesel cycle. And the, the, the concept, the foundation we have used is from back to the 80s, where we designed it for the mechanical engines, where we are operating on the diesel principle. And the reason for it at that time to take that step was that with this type of technology, you can burn a lot of different fuels and you still keep the high efficiency. We are talking about up to talking about up to 55 percent in in efficiency of what is coming in and what is coming out uh, to the shaft. Uh, then we have a GA engine. This is a later invention. It is called from the market, uh, especially for LNG carriers. Then we have engines for ethane methanol you have seen what happens here the last one and a half year after ap miller mersk they started ordering container vessels for for methanol at that time we only had 23 orders and that was all for methanol carriers like we have ethane for ethane carriers we have the lpg for lpg carriers and so forth but now methanol was it, it actually went up to be one of the fuels like ammonia, which every talk, everybody speaks about. And we have had a lot of orders. We are now at 78 in, in one, of a half, one and a half years. We came from 23 to, to 78 and very huge engines with very huge footprint, you can say, in the exhaust gas uh, of emission. When this is set, the interest in methanol have not in any way put a cover on the interest in ammonia. I'm sure that if we had a meta an ammonia engine today, we would have plus five, 50 plus plus orders already. We don't have the E-methanol out there. We don't have the E-ammonia out there, uh, green stuff and so on. But please think always, we have uh, <coughs> a life cycle about 20 to 25 years on these vessels. We have in service now 22,300 engines, two-stroke MAN BMW engines in service. So this is quite a lot of number of large engines which are out there. And that is not all possible to convert every all of them from one step to the other, but it takes time but it is, as we can see it, what we can listen to from the market going in the right direction. Diesel principle, it was also already mentioned by René here, very simple coming up in top. We have injection of pilot oil, it burns, and we inject the dual fuel into this burning flame and thereby have quite a control of what is happening up there. This is the engine itself. 
if you look at the top, something should pop up. It didn't. But this is this modular system, injection system, that is put into individual cylinder liners. If it's a six cylinder, you have six of such units on each cylinder for this specific fuel oil. Because of the composition of all these different type of dual fuel engines we have, we cannot make, a, 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 you can say, a common multi-fuel engine. We have to specify what you see here, which is this injection system. The yellow is the double wall co pipe coming into the valve block and you have the injection, the hydraulic system activation and so on. All of that is something put on to the existing do, uh, diesel burning two-stroke engine. It's an add-on, you can say. It's not a new engine, and that makes it so much more easy. We have also, with classification societies, made a lot of hazard hazard investigations. It is, of course, necessary to ensure that the fuel supply system is safe, high reliability and availability. Still remember, two-stroke engine, you have one engine, there's no gear or anything. You have a shaft directly out to the propeller. If something happens with the engine, main engine, the engine is dead. It cannot move. So, <clears throat> fuel gas supply system in here. We have started quite early. We have now made our hazard number four uh, for ammonia. So, we are on the way, you could say. Going to the different areas in such a development, and it's just to illustrate that it's it takes time to develop. We started in 2019 looking at ammonia. And so, and I will come with the scale to later here, but we see the emission, we have heard about N2O, in order not, for that not to be a dog, uh, a, what is called a bottleneck. Uh, let's say we have too high level of N2O laughter gas. Then we in parallel are developing uh, a, a reactor, you could call it, to actually take the N2O so there will be no in the exhaust gas. If this is going to be standard of the engine, is only if, when we are testing the engine, it shows that we have the N2O. Then there is the higher uh, NOx uh, for ammonia. We will have a larger uh, SCR catalyst. We will use uh, ammonia as agent and not urea. Uh, and, and we will also be able to take care of that. Uh, when it comes to tier two, it's something that we do on the engine side itself, probably. But let's see when we start the testing up. Ammonia slip is also very important uh, that we don't have any smell uh, and any release uh, to the air like that. And this is also a, a control that we are taking very much care of. Elastomers, ceilings, O-rings, and so on is is something we have investigated. We are clear there. Corrosion of materials clear. Maintenance intervals. We have a cooperation with lube oil companies who go in and look at this. You can say when this mixture you will have when you have the sealing air up against uh, the ammonia in the injection uh, pumps and so on. What we can do there. We have. Uh, we are there now. Or derva venting. This is something we take care of. Safety is the one in the middle, and that was what I talked about, the hazards and our HACCP investigations, and the combustion. Combustion is, you know, we are engineers, we are like kids in the candy store, we really want this engine to start up as soon as possible. It has been somewhat delayed, that's for sure. The pandemic has been one thing, but we have also have other issues, and right now we have an issue uh, we, we will solve, but an issue that has postponed the starting of the first engine at least to the beginning of 2023, unfortunately. It is, we are now uh, living in a living area, our uh, office and research center, and there were coming in special precautions and we have to take care of that, of course. But it doesn't change what we have said all the time, that the first engine will be delivered to a yard in 2024. And with one of our biggest licenses, Mitsui, they will build a 7S60. We will have all the testing from our test research. We will also test when this is on testbed for delivery at their engine factory. We will make further testing and so on, and then delivered uh, to, uh, to a yard uh, put into the vessel. 
We also have a, another also very big Hyundai Indian builder who is also looking in to go uh, and, and, and make a, a 60 ball engine, maybe a G-type, but let's see. Again, there is a huge interest out there, not only for uh, ship owners. And, and what we have seen the latest year is also now the charter is coming in and pointing out for the ship owner and saying, I want you to have a, a footprint of CO2, which is lower than you have with the fossil fuels and so on. At least the vessel should be prepared for it and so on. The modular injection system I showed before is something we can retrofit if you have a full electronic engine. So technically, this can be done. It is not, uh, it's not an easy job, so, but we have already done it, and it is getting easier each time, and we get more experience. It's also about a cooperation with the shipyard, who is taking uh, as a main contractor, and then us taking part of, of what is done on the engine itself. So in principle, if you have this single fuel burning engine on fuel oil, you can retrofit it for LNG, LED, methanol, LPG, and also for the coming uh, ammonia. See, now I have two slides and then I'm finished. This um, <clears throat> is from our, what I like to call our crystal ball department. Uh, uh, first of all, is maybe more correct because here is facts where you see that out of all the two-stroke engines, both us and our competitor, Mindy out of, uh, of what have been uh, contracted to us, uh, contracted this year in Gigawatt, more than 50% is for dual fuel engines. And here we have the one from the crystal ball department where you can see this expectation about the other type of applications, other type of vessels, what uh, is expected for them to increase. I asked them, could I believe in this? And they say, you can be very sure that it will never end like it's shown there. But it's the closest we can get. And of course, that is the complication in all this looking into the future. Ah, there was only one slide more. We also have to go and look at cylinder loop oil, and we work very closely with the loop oil. Uh, and this is not because of telling what we are doing and so on in that respect. It's just to inform what is necessary. When you start up going into a new future fuel, you have also to consider the loop oil uh, utilized. So thank you very much. Again, we have a, a first mover that uh, is sharing uh, the experience. Uh, there is um, a lot ongoing, a bit, uh, a bit everywhere, uh, but clearly there are challenges that need the solutions. Uh, but the, the, the technology, uh, of course, uh, is, is getting more and more mature, for sure. I would suggest that we just break for a coffee break you have your uh, um, informal chats uh, after having absorbed uh, all this information about the gaps uh, and uh, the engine uh, manufacturer perspective and then we reconvene for the discussion and question and answers on this uh, specific uh, module so we will reconvene at uh, uh, Lisbon time 3.30, please. So Lisbon time, 15.30. Thank you.
Welcome back. Before this short break, we had uh, two different presentations, but both of them were, of course, um, focused uh, on, uh, on one hand, on technology uh, and how the engine producers are equipping themselves with the instruments to support the transition. And the other presentation was uh, a, a, a full overview on the technical suitability of the, 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 the fuels in question, as well as a, a full overview of the gaps that will need to be filled in to accompany the uptake of, uh, of uh, biofuels uh, and uh, uh, ammonia. With the different magnitude, as I said, of the challenges involved, uh, with the, the dimension of toxicity that uh, characterizes uh, ammonia, and uh, on the other end, uh, for biofuels, uh, the, 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 the drop-in approach and the degree of this uh, drop-in approach that can be followed. I would like a bit to open uh, uh, the discussion on this uh, um, volley, so the regulatory gaps that we have, and uh, of course the the technical dimension that is, of course, involved in the use of these alternative sources of power, both for ships and ashore, reminding the concept of, of, of chain that, of course, is, is involved for any transition that needs to become stable and fully absorbed by the sector. So, who would like to take the floor? I'm sure there are questions for, uh, for the part related to the regulatory gaps. Please remind that this is a technical workshop, so it's not that you are uh, taking a political stance, but you are, we are here really to, to, to share information at technical level. Anybody in the room that would like to take the floor in relation to these uh, regulatory gaps? The overview we got from ABS was quite comprehensive. You had uh, a full overview of what's uh, currently ongoing and what is still uh, missing and needs to be tackled. A reference was made to the, the, the potential role of Ajax the ongoing work uh, by different classification societies, the need for standards. Ricardo. Thank you, Manuela. And um, to, to add to uh, what was presented in terms of uh, regulatory gaps, uh, standardization was mentioned, uh, and in particular, in relation to the alternative fuel infrastructure regulation, um, we mentioned it in the morning. Um, it has targets for shore power and targets for LNG bunkering uh, facilities, but the, the framework, the standardization framework for LNG is rather mature at the moment. Uh, it was not, this, it was not uh, such a case in maybe five, ten years from now, um, in the past. But in the context of the AFIR, in the context of the current regulatory development, there's a standardization request to send Senelec for um, standards for bunkering of uh, methanol and ammonia, and also for uh, shoreside battery charging, which is a, a different topic that we'll be touching in a different day. But um, in particular for uh, methanol and ammonia, the standardization request is specifically for the refueling of ships. And it is expected that in future revisions, Potentially, targets also will be developed for these uh, for these uh, for these fuels, but at the moment, this is not included. Uh, however, the standardization is really the first step, and I think this reinforces really what uh, has been presented also in the in the study. Um, on the on the safety um, on the safety aspects, 
Um, indeed, I I believe that um, the fuel cells um, guidelines they they were uh, finalized without having yet a, a clear. Uh, framework for the storage and the uh, handling of hydrogen on board so I believe um, that was not covered but the similar aspect for ammonia uh, can be derived also on board um, but as far as the AFID framework is concerned this has been requested one one comment that has been brought by Sen Senelec uh, in reply was typically there is shortage of uh, technical expertise to work on the standards and I believe that the, currently what is being uh, uh, what is being faced is really this uh, shortage of uh, uh, expertise to to develop these. Uh, we see that the industry has experience, guidance, uh, technical recommendations. So I believe it's bringing things together that is the main challenge now. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. Exactly, is, is how we can move the next step. Malta, please, David. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Well, I would like to thank EMSA for this excellent opportunity to learn a lot more and share this experience. Um, wearing my hat as a port operator, um, I would like to see how the people in this room and, and even at the commission level, how we can harmonize the, the aspects of now all these ships with potentially different fuels that may require different emergency approaches and possibly certain berthing or port restrictions because of the nature of an LNG vessel next to a vessel taking ammonia or whatever, uh, I think it would be useful at the European level to us start thinking about harmonizing the good practice within the ports and within the, the shipping lines so that as much as possible we can have a harmonized operation within the European ports. It's more of a statement. I don't have the answers for that, but I just, I thought it would be useful to put it on the table. Yes, that is a bit uh, the uh, the challenge that uh, we have all to face. Uh, I see Man that would like to have the floor. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, I, I just want to mention something I didn't mention in my presentation, but for our engines, we cannot operate on ammonia or methane or methanol or ethane or LPG below 10% load. That means when you go into the the harbor itself, you will not have any of those in the engine room. Uh, exactly when you are, you stop, for instance, using methane, you will flush the system. So there will be no methane in the piping in uh, uh, when you go in. It's just a comment. Uh, thank you. Yes, I think that, 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 that there are some uh, technology <laughs> <laughs> challenges for uh, for sure um david i think it's it's a, it, it's a, what we have uh, in front of us uh, really needs a systematic approach uh, all the different initiatives in a way need to be put together in support of uh, of, uh, of a vision as a matter of fact and uh, and uh, we know that uh, there is uh, there are initiatives here and there, uh, but to compose this in a vision that then becomes, uh, as I said, a structural approach, uh, we really need to put a lot of brains and a lot of perspectives uh, together. That is uh, that is for sure. But what uh, what what uh, what else uh, the people around the table think? We have a request from the floor from the Netherlands. The Netherlands from the floor from online, please. Yeah. Thank you. Good afternoon. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for organizing. It was very interesting to uh, to participate. Uh, it's a pity I couldn't be there. I would have liked to uh, have been there live, but uh, unfortunately, uh, online now at this moment. Um, if we're if we're looking at at, at the transition, 
Um, I think man, many of us are busy developing a roadmap. That's 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 something that uh, that we in the Netherlands at least are doing. Um, in this regard, I have a, I have a question relating to the various fuels. How do the engine manufacturers see uh, the split being developed in terms of power? If you start very small, that will most likely be electrical for the small ferries and things like that. And later on, you will have fuels like methanol. And, and uh, when the vessels become larger and storage issues will not be much of a problem, you will see a shift to ammonia and hydrogen. And where where will these 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 boundaries? Well, where where will these shifts lie, according to uh, the engine manufacturers? Thank you. Man. <coughs> yes, I'm a man. Yeah. Um, I um, <coughs> That's a very good question. You know, I'm coming from the two-stroke division. We also have four strokes, uh, of course. Um, if you look at two-stroke, we are from the market informed that uh, ammonia is the way to go, it, at least one of the way to go, methanol, ammonia, LNG, ELNG, biofuels, and so on, that's for sure, but not hydrogen. That is what uh, we hear from the market right now. So that's why we concentrate on ammonia. When we look at our four-stroke engines, they are looking more on hydrogen, but also ammonia and also methanol. They are a little bit behind time-wise, and it will f take a few years more before they are ready. But they are looking at it like other engine manufacturers are also doing. Um, of course, the, the smaller a vessel is, smaller the engine is, relatively the more expensive it will be, it will be to make it a dual-fuel engine. But uh, we don't have as such uh, limitations uh, not not at that moment, no, if I understand you correct. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ioannis, please. Uh, thank you, Manuela. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I don't want to preclude uh, what is the conclusion of uh, today's session, but I mean, I hear, and that's what I, we heard just now as well, that uh, the market goes for ammonia. I'm putting it in very broad terms. And uh, on this basis or taking in this into account, my question actually to, to the engine manufacturer would be, uh, what is the stage? What are, where are we in terms of safety for that? I saw uh, in your slide that has it has been somehow performed. We, we know we have an identification of hazards. But we we don't have yet engines. We don't have yet any practical experience. No, nothing on the field. I think the first uh, ship to be built on uh, with an uh, ammonia engine will be in 2024. So, how long do you think we we have to go yet in terms of safety? Man, please. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, we speak with a lot of operators, at, and for them, they say that uh, ammonia. Hmm, can my crew on board handle ammonia? Not only as cargo, but also when it comes to the engine itself. And I think that's what, what we hear from the market is the biggest issue, because we do believe that we can make a safe system. And of course, not, we are not doing it alone, it's together with classification societies and thereby also, to a certain extent, the flag states. And that's extremely important. Safety for us is, is everything. You know, before we, we had the methane engine accepted by the marine society, it took a long, it, an, a huge number of hazard hazard investigation with the different classification societies, with yards, engine builders and authorities in different directions, and also an explosion study we had to, to make if you go back in time, it is not as easy to remember, but in the zero zeros, there was a lot of concern by using methane. And, and looking at the experience, service experience, we have more than 2 million service hours on, on methane. I would say that's been done very well. The question is, if we take the toxic like ammonia, will we be sure that we can handle it totally safely? I do believe we can. 
but there is much more training necessary, I would say, for the people on board. Uh, uh, and, and there is an, another mindset in some way than just using fossil fuel oil as we have done in so many decades. Yes, the dimension of the of the human element. Huh? It's 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 uh, really crucial in in, in all of this, and uh, we are all uh, very much aware. And uh, we do hope also that the ongoing revision of the STCW convention and code will reflect <laughs> in a in a functional way uh, what is going to be needed by by our crews. Uh, on board and and ashore also because also ashore in ports uh, port workers will need to upgrade their skills for sure to to handle this um we have uh, questions from uh, the chat but uh, b uh, i don't know if anybody here uh, wants to 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 stress a con uh, we, we have uh, different member states around the table also, and uh, you are all engaged and involved in the ongoing uh, discussions on the different table as, as regulators. And uh, uh, a comment that often now comes up is that, uh, in a way, the regulators are running after, running after the industry. Mm, because uh, it's uh, the industry is, is moving, the the the, the, the regulators uh, are still defining uh, the framework uh, and, and so on. What is your your approach, uh, your vision in 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 all of this? Would anybody share uh, what's happening at your level? Because, of course, uh, there is a lot ongoing in this moment, in, in a lot of different tables. And you are uh, directly involved. Anybody from uh, the chat or uh, from the room representing the regulators, the member states, uh, would, like, would wish to share or comment? You are all very strangely silent today. I'm not used to it, I must say. Normally, I have a lot of vocal people from uh, the member states mm. that know exactly what they would like to say. We have? OK, Daniel, please. I mean, it's not related to this. It was related to the safety aspects. Uh, I think that as ammonia will be, there will be a more uptake of ammonia. I think we need to take into consideration that there will be more, uh, more bunkering uh, being performed, more interactions with ammonia being performed. So even though uh, we work a lot on the safety aspects to minimize all the risks, uh, you know, the quantity of operations will increase as well. So as we reduce as much as we can the safety or risks and put in all sorts of mitigations, on the other hand, with the uptake, this, the, other, the number of interactions will, will increase. So there may be a counterbalance there from the actual uptake of the fuels that will lead to some issues of uh, uh, some safety issues happening in the future. So, so then it comes in the ports operations, the bunkering operations and all these things. So. Uh, uh, just to highlight that, uh, of course, we can we work at, I mean, as much as we can on all these aspects. But in the end, there's also this uh, the uptake itself will bring uh, potential risks as well. We know that the safety dimension is essential, and tomorrow we dig uh, further uh, in into this uh, because it's also very, very um, important in terms of uh, uptake as a matter of the effect of, of uh, these alternative uh, sources of, uh, of, of power. So, um, it seems that member states don't want to talk. OK, so you will talk uh, at IMO, you will talk uh, <laughs> in uh, all the negotiations that you will have uh, to, to, to face uh, now that uh, Ricardo says that the, tomorrow the European Parliament will uh, define their their position and then the trilogues will start uh, uh, I, I tell you that from uh, our technical perspective
perspective, uh, and this is something that uh, we always discuss with the Commission, we really need to, to know what is the framework that we are going to apply. Because it's, it's important now that at least in terms of uh, direction, there is a clarity and certainty. So also from our perspective, we can offer all the tools that will be needed to, to implement this framework. Because there is an among us and among us a work to do in terms of implementation, monitoring, enforcement. And so we really need to, to now move and know what we are going to, to implement. Okay, let's take your questions from the chat, Sergio. Yeah, there was uh, one question uh, related to insurance and uh, what could be the forecast. Uh, we are talking about new fields uh, coming into, well, in the near future in the market. Uh, SIPs will be certified against uh, interim guidelines, uh, class notations. Uh, we are trying to address here the SIP owners, whether there is any ex expectation that it will be more difficult to insure uh, the SIP and uh, whether the premiums will go higher with the new fields uh, coming. Anybody that can uh, can can share insight on this uh, specific uh, dimension? Uh, we are moving more uh, in the dimension of uh, economic and uh, cost. Is there anything that we can say, ABS? Yeah, we have um, we have tried to look into insurance cost uh, for for a dual fuel uh, but but uh, at this time it's uh, it's very uncertain uh, but we estimate that it's uh, probably the same as you see on on LNG and and uh, methanol ship uh, i don't think we can come it closer uh, at this uh, point of time but there is uh, an increase in insurance cost that uh, uh, has to be underlined thank you very much and uh... Of course, there are also a, a lot of other factors that uh, are going to have uh, an impact on the cost structure, uh, also ongoing events. So it's going to be another layer and dimension that uh, will um, complicate further. Sergio. Well, there were questions related to fugitive emissions in the case of ammonia and uh, well, the impacts on uh, when these uh, emissions reconvert in the atmosphere to nitrous oxides, for example, where there is a, a higher global warming potential and whether there will be a need uh, to have uh, additional regulations uh, to tackle that uh, problem, uh, maybe limiting the amount of uh, ammonia that slips uh, from the engine in the combustion. And this is something that we address also in, in the studies and uh, and issues related to that. There was also uh, a similar uh, comment uh, to that I think you already addressed on uh, uh, low loads uh, for engines and uh, the temperatures and the, I mean, how this affects uh, NOx emissions is related to, to this matter. Any additional uh, insight on this from ABS, please? I yeah I don't know what to, uh, to what to add more there on on the NOx side. I think uh, we have we have seen the, now the first uh, uh, first result uh, for for some engines being tested on ammonia, and it seems that uh, NOx emission is not going to be that high at least for the diesel cycle as as uh, first uh, anticipated. Um, but uh, of course uh, it's very premature uh, what we see now uh, and it's uh, also connected with a lot of uncertainties uh, what what happens uh, at low load and uh, this has to be explored uh, much more before we can we can answer that with, with at least a little bit of uh, certainty at this time um, the other question was uh, into o uh, emission there uh, that was uh, not solely related to to combustion was also related from from uh, uh, spill of ammonia. Uh, this is something that we have discussed uh, lately here, but it's not uh, part of the study that we have done. And uh, it may uh, or should have been included. That's uh, that's for sure. It's uh, they're pointing at uh, at a thing we should have uh, been looking into. Uh, it is something that. Uh, 
will be investigated in, in, in different forums. If I can just add something, I think that if also look into the past, when we're trying these new fuels, we would not think about uh, the other consequences of you changing to a new fuel. Um, we're discovering things in methane sleep, how to treat the methane sleep now, and then LNG engines have been there for a long time. So the good thing is that at least when you're trying to implement new, uh, like implement a new fuel like ammonia now, at least everybody's thinking about what are the other consequences because we cannot be catched in the future with something that we didn't foresee now. And uh, when you talk to the engine makers, of course, the N2O is a big one there. It's a big one in the in the optimization of the combustion process. You know, they don't they don't want to shift the the, the problem. They want to they will burn something that is carbon free and but then leads to another problem. So at least the, the consideration that uh, is not a simple matter, that there may be consequences that never nobody thought of uh, are there. It's, it's really positive. We also hear from other industries, from some of the ship owners with whom we talk, that when they consider ammonia, they also think about what, what about a spillage? What about if that happens? So do you know the consequences of that? So at least these questions are being asked by the industry. So it's, it's, it, it is a positive thing, I, I, would, I would say, that it's necessary to highlight. Thank you very much. Anything else from the chat? Then I, I have a question that uh, maybe we'll also... Um, your, your last slide, you were referring uh, to, for biofuels, to two big uh, gaps, as you defined, and 23 for the ammonia context. So can you share what are these two for the biofuels and choose two? from the ammonia that in your opinion are really really big ones thank you for the biofuel i need to dig because i don't remember from top of my mind what were the, those were uh, for the ammonia of course we have the lack of uh, igf code that's uh, that's a big one uh, yeah there's it's not there yet uh, and this needs to be developed. And there is also a one one case which, which is related to the, the lack of IGF. And then there is a question, is the IGF the proper way to put the regulation for safety of ammonia? That's another question that can be raised. So not, I don't want to preclude that uh, the ammonia should fit into the IGF. This is a discussion the IMO has to have as well. So this aspect is, is uh, the ammonia is a few, is, is a big one. For, uh, uh, and then of course, there are some other things in the marple and uh, that, uh, that uh, prevent the ammonia to be used as a fuel because it's a toxic uh, gas, it's a toxic uh, you know, liquid. So th these are two things that need to be addressed because as it is right now, you know, the, the regulations make it specific that uh, that cannot happen. For the biofuel, and as there are many less, uh, I will need to see which were those two ones, but I can come back and, uh, in a short way. Yeah. One of them is sustainability, yeah, of course. Thank you, Hane. Because he's also highlighting the safety studies that we're going to uh, conduct tomorrow. It's not only about the things that I said today in terms of sustainability criteria, what makes a uh, biofuel really sustainable. Um, of course, you need to know that. You need to have a life cycle guidelines and have to have a uniform sustainability criteria industry wide and cross industry as well, so that you allow investment to be put in the right place. Uh, this is a big one, but not only for the GHG impact, but also from safety perspective as well, because the, the, depending on the biomass that you use, you may have a more acidic or less acidic biofuel or different properties will appear. So it's important for the safety considerations of the operations of the vessel in a port, you know, that you have highlighted that, you know, it's one specific type of biofuels that the, the ship is using when they are entering to port, and that may lead to some precautions to be highlighted. So this aspect that uh, there is no uh, standardized way about um, how to, um, to look at the biofuels from how they are produced, from where, and it's not only the biomass, it's also the, 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 the pathway. Sometimes the same biomass can lead to different fuels if they use different uh, processing uh, 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 types. So um, I think this is a big one. And uh, the other one is, uh, yeah, I, I cannot remember from top of my mind. Hey, Ney, maybe you do. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think I, I, I will as well refresh myself and, and read the, again the, the, the study. Uh, 
anybody else who would like to intervene at this stage? I know that there has been a lot of information shared uh, today that needs, uh, of course, also to be digested in the proper way. Please see that. Yes, thank you. I, I uh, wanted to react to a, a question that's been posted on the, on the, uh, in the chat uh, about um, uh, if there is such a large um, interest from the, from the um, industry for ammonia fueled ships and ammonia fueled engine or ammonia engines. Um, it, is, is a technology neutral approach uh, for which there are a lot of, um, uh, of good arguments to make, is that still uh, the right way forward? <coughs> Um, and and I think you could indeed revisit this this question uh, if you have in mind uh, the, um, uh, the 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 need to build up uh, bunkering infrastructure in various parts of the world, uh, uh, supply parts in various parts of the world. And if it it, it is to, it it is really amazing. Uh, there is no ammonia engine, and um, <laughs> an engine manufacturer is telling us that he could sell fifty of an engine that doesn't exist. So this interest from the market is is so unexpectedly large that it may even be the case that um, uh, a lot of shipping companies have already made up their mind that this is the fuel of the future. And then I want to point out that when, then I come back because this was more or less speculation, but come back to our study uh, where we say, okay, there, uh, there are uh, various um, uh, uh, green ammonia projects uh, around the world. Many of them are in a, um, uh, a feasibility study phase. Uh, so investment decisions will be taken on the basis of the information that the, the investors have on whether they can uh, market this product. Um, and then a more explicit uh, push for demand from the shipping sector may actually help uh, flip the coin towards making this investment. Um, and, um, and and also, if these if investments come true, we can, just like for biofuels, expect quite a lot of competition uh, have for, uh, uh, ultimately it boils down in that case to competition about uh, green electricity. Um, and, and which sector will ultimately um, have have the benefit of the, the green electricity also depends, as we wrote in our, our uh, study, on the policies that are in place. So those are some considerations, also going back to our discussion this morning on te technology neutrality. Thanks. Thank you very much for these additional uh, comments. It's, it's, it's not by chance that uh, we started our cycle of, of studies with, with, with ammonia and uh, biofuels. So it's, um, it's clear that uh, um, it was the, the, the right move for sure to, to start with it too, uh, even if there are uh, challenges uh, that, uh, that, that they will need to be, to be handled. Ricardo. You uh, are, of course, uh, as European Commission, uh, uh, with the vision and the strategy to push for the uptake of uh, alternative uh, energy solutions for, uh, for ships and the shore, because as a matter of fact, it's, it's a package that looks uh, at, uh, at, all the, uh, at all the aspects. And uh, uh, you stated very clearly that it's uh, technology neutral, because that is the approach that the European Commission is, is following, also to take into consideration the fact that uh, um, there is not one solution for, for all kinds of, of traffic, ships and so on. What is your take of this first round of information sharing? Thank you, Manuela. I believe that um, when we, we state technology neutrality, when we we try to simplify this concept in, in, this, uh, in this way, 
I mean, we hide a lot of the complexities behind the technical challenges, the safety, compatibility, uncertainty with respect to availability of production. So I believe that technology neutrality is a bit of a naked terminology when it comes to uh, engage really into a uh, more deep conversation. And I believe this exchange today revealed how complex uh, the future will be in terms of uh, um, technology in terms of uh, economical uh, assessment of different operating profiles for different ships, for different sectors. Rule mentioned in the morning is not here, so he will not be able to uh, stand on my, on my feet. But uh, he mentioned the fourth propulsion revolution in shipping. It's not only in shipping uh, in on board ships, it's also on the supply chains for fuels, on the bunkering market, we will go from a largely broadly uniform bunkering, which can be developed on a spot bunkering approach and will develop into a more contract based uh, uh, bunkering uh, supply contracts for different shipping uh, uh, segments for supply of specific fuels for specific ship designs. Each one of them will have their own challenges. I believe part of what has been achieved here today was really putting the light on gaps, aspects to be followed up. Um, and I think this is really um, what I take away from today. And I, I, I think that the studies that the agencies just uh, published are an excellent uh, cornerstone in order to uh, build future initiatives, not only policy related, but remarkably uh, on the technical level, standardization. I believe this was already what was achieved with LNG. It started in, uh, in back in 2013, I believe, with an LNG bunkering study. And, and from the gaps that were uh, identified there, there was a substantial and, and, and uh, consistent follow-up, and I believe that uh, uh, the agency is following its own good steps. So, thank you. Thank you, Ricardo, for uh, providing this helicopter point of view that it's always uh, very useful. I look at the end of the table where I have other actors that normally are quite vocal. Anybody would like to share the, 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 the first take of this first day of sharing of information? Now oh, you're very silent, for sure. From the chat, anybody would like to, to share? If not, uh, I will share my... No? Silence. Silence. Okay. So, I would uh, uh, conclude the, this first day by saying uh, that uh, you may have noticed that we don't have the answers uh, to all the questions. But uh, we, we have uh, at least uh, on the table uh, uh, two documents that in a comprehensive and structured way look at uh, a lot of uh, factors that are going to influence choices that uh, will need to be made in a very near future in terms of investments. And when I refer to investments, I don't refer uh, only to ship owners and ports, uh, but I refer to the whole chain that is involved in a well-to-wake perspective. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, uh, the uh, presentations that we had uh, today 
give a clear indication of the state of play of the expected projections both from the demand and supply side but they point also the finger on gaps that need to be filled in and the commitment of the uh, fora that are involved in the definition of uh, the, the standards and in the definition of the regulations will clearly need to step up because the, the gaps need to filled in, be filled in. But at the same time, uh, there are first movers that are already going ahead and uh, a, a lot of initiatives ongoing trying really to to see how all of this can be shaped in a way that is uh, sustainable and safe at the same time uh, we are, uh, uh, I would not say we are at the starting of the game, we are in the middle of the game, so we don't have uh, uh, very much choice, uh, but work all together to fill uh, these gaps and then provide those uh, criteria that uh, will then uh, be in support also of, of, of steering uh, investments for sure. The studies are, are quite lengthy. Uh, there is a summary that provides a, a, an overview of the main conclusions. But the, the richness is in the details that are, are, are provided in the document. And uh, I am sure you will find a lot of inspiration in the information that is shared there. That, uh, as I said, uh, it's, uh, it's not going in the direction to say that uh, one fuel is better than another, than another one, but it's going in the direction to provide the the full information on what it means to use one source of energy and the questions that still need to be to be answered. I do hope that uh, uh, you found this first day interesting and that the silence that I had around the table was uh, a silence of uh, appreciation for the information sharing that was done around the table and uh, we will reconvene uh, tomorrow with uh, going into depth uh, in uh, other two dimensions that are uh, very important as well if we looked at the technical dimension we will and uh, the more sustainability and availability dimension we will tomorrow look at the cost, at the economic dimension, and the safety dimension. So I, I'm sure that we will continue to get a lot of very interesting information from uh, the consortium. And with this, uh, I wish you a pleasant uh, evening at home or in Lisbon. And see you tomorrow at... Uh, 8.55 Lisbon time. Thank you. Have a nice evening.